Good morning, everyone. My name is Lee Fisher. I'm the Dean of Cleveland Marshall College of Law, and I want to welcome you to our virtual health law conference. The title of it is Medical Legal Lessons Learned from the Pandemic. We have a phenomenal array of speakers today up until about three o'clock. And this morning, I'm simply your MC for the beginning to introduce the people who have been instrumental in making this conference a great success. It's my uh, pleasure to first introduce to you uh, a person who has become very well known in a short period of time here at Cleveland State and in Cleveland, uh, Vice Admiral Forrest Faison, uh, be recently became the Senior Vice President for Research and Innovation and the Chief Healthcare Strategy Officer for Cleveland State University. Now, ironically, he began his job about a week or two before COVID hit. And it, even though that was not a good thing for America, it was a good thing that Forrest Faison was at Cleveland State. Because if you want to deal with a healthcare epidemic, you want somebody uh, who actually has served as the 38th Surgeon General of the Navy and Chief of the Bureau of Medicine and Surgery. And in that role, had a network, oversaw a network of 63,000 medical personnel stationed around the world who provide high quality healthcare to more than 1 million people. Uh, it could not have been better for Cleveland State to have someone with uh, Forrest Faison's uh, credentials and experience leading us through this pandemic. And it's why Cleveland State University has been held up as a model throughout the nation, nation uh, and how uh, a university or any institution for higher education has responded to COVID-19. So we ask Forrest Faison to give us a welcome this morning and we're very honored that he's with the Cleveland State and even more honored that he's with us today. Forrest Faison, I turn it to you. Uh, Dean Fisher, thank you so much. I really do appreciate your kind words and, uh, and uh, thank you again for the opportunity to be here and to speak. Well, good morning, everyone. It's, uh, it's great to see you all, uh, at least virtually uh, anyway. It's, uh, thank you for taking the time to be here. This is an important meeting and an important discussion that will occur today. Y you know, we've had pandemics throughout history. Um, you know, they're not new. Um, it's not the first one and it won't be the last one. We've had them throughout history, but this one was different. Um, it wasn't really different from a medical perspective. Um, it's behaved like many other pandemics in the past from a medical perspective, but it was very different from a social perspective. Um, it exposed some ugly truths that we knew were there, but had never really been confronted or forced to deal with, um, that there really is social disparities. There really are differences in healthcare access. It really does matter what zip code you live in and how long you live or whether you survive. Um, we have never had to deal with that before, even though we knew at some level that it existed. It was also the first pandemic that was really to a great extent politicized. Um, and it exposed issues that we as a society are going to have to address. Um, when does my health trump your freedom of choice? We live in a society, in cities, in towns, in communities. We interact with each other on a regular basis. You know, what is our collective responsibility, not only to ourselves, but to our neighbors? Um, and which is more important in times of crisis? When is the collective good more important than individual rights? And are there limits of freedom of speech um, for the collective good? Um, you know, when, like we don't yell fire in a theater, are there other limits on speech that are critical during crisis times? And then who gets to decide that? We've also explored new technologies and new ways of living that will create challenges and opportunities for us. We'll have a discussion later today on telemedicine. You know, the big issue with telemedicine is going to be medical licensure and state medical boards. Um, state medical boards have, have, have controlled and guarded uh, medical licensure within their state for a variety of different reasons. Well, now telemedicine um, is, is allowed medical care to go beyond borders, beyond boundaries. What does that mean for licensure? What does that mean for culpability and responsibility? Um, are there limits on malpractice um, that need to come into play when medical care must be delivered remotely because it's not able to be delivered in person? What does that mean and what does that look like? So challenging old paradigms um, are things that we're going to have to deal with. People have learned to work from home and it's pretty nice. 
And should an employer be able to dictate where you must work so long as you're able to get the work done? Uh, and what are the limits for that? And who decides that? There are many, many questions to be, to be uh, addressed and answered. And so it's good to start talking about those now. And so I thank you for being here today. Uh, I thank you for all that you will do to help us as a nation move forward, get back to normal, and prepare for the next time. So thank you very much, Dean Fisher, and to everyone for being here today. Dr. Faison, thank you very much for those introductory remarks. We really appreciate it. We know you're not gonna be able to stay for throughout the day, but we appreciate you joining us as long as you can this morning. Uh, the next person I get to introduce is Professor Gwendolyn roberts Majette. Uh, professor Majette is a professor here at Cleveland Marshall, uh, and she is our senior health law professor. Uh, she teaches health care, uh, law and policy, health care legislation, uh, the, and the regulatory process, health care finance, introduction to international health, human rights, and public health. She's taught at John Hopkins University, American University, Washington College of Law, Howard uh, University School of Law, and at the School of Medicine. And her work focuses on many areas, not the least of which are patients' rights, delivery system reform, global health, and health care disparities. Professor Majette, it's all yours. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Dean Fisher, for that kind introduction. Uh, so I want to just um, talk about the Health Law Center for a minute. Um, the Health Law Center specializes in teaching a variety of health law classes. Um, it also offers externships for students that are interested in health law and pursuing certificates. It also has pop-up practicums. So for example, um, I took my health legislation, regulation and policy students to go with me to Massachusetts when I was serving as an expert advisor to the Massachusetts Provider Price Variation Commission. Um, it also, um, it allows students to specialize and we have certain certificates that students can take advantage of like the general health law certificate or a compliance certificate. Um, and so we have revised our website significantly this year. And so you can see all of the information about the Health Law Center on the website. I'd also just like to take and thank some students who actually completed the program. So I have had several students that have taken one or several health law classes from me and pursued the certificates. One of them is Mr. Gordon Gant. He is on our advisory committee planning for this particular conference. Uh, he took several classes from me and when he graduated, he joined University Hospitals Compliance Department. Um, and now he is in their general counsel's office. Another uh, person, a student uh, that went into healthcare is Ms. Nicole Klein. She took several uh, health law classes and she is now an attorney at uh, McDonald Hopkins. So students have pursued these um, opportunities and been given great, wonderful jobs upon graduation. We also involve our students. And so uh, we have Ms. Brandy Davis uh, on the committee and she represents the Health Law Society. Um, and another person that was a part of the planning committee is Ms. Emma Thompson. She is the editor-in-chief of the Health Law Journal. So those are just um, a couple of things. I don't know if someone else is going to introduce some of the adjuncts like Stephen Sozio, who is a partner at Jones Day, uh, who has been with us since the beginning and also taught uh, in the past compliance. Um, so we've had a variety of people and it's an excellent program. That just gives you an insight and some other people might share more things later on throughout the day. Thank you, Professor Majette. Uh, the next person I get to introduce is the newest member of our faculty and she's hit the ground running uh, and was very involved in working with Professor Majette and Kim Bixenstein on today's conference. Uh, Professor Krista Laser is an innovation and intellectual property law professor here at our law school. She practiced for nine years as an intellectual property litigator at the law firms of Wilmer Hale and Kirkland and Ellis, two of the largest firms in the world, where she represented uh, leading life sciences and technology companies. Her scholarship has been cited uh, by briefs to the US Supreme Court and judges of the Federal Circuit Court of Appeals, 
and has appeared on several top 10 lists of recent scholarship in her field. Professor Laser. Thank you so much for that kind introduction, Dean Fisher. So as Dean Fisher mentioned, I'm Professor Laser. I'm so excited to have joined the faculty at Cleveland Marshall College of Law, where I focus on innovation and intellectual property. Innovation law is critical to the breakthroughs in medicine that we're relying on to resolve this pandemic. Whether it's resolving the scope of intellectual property rights that affect new drugs and therapeutics or determining the safe pace of studies on the safety and efficacy of regulatory approval. We think that innovation law and healthcare law go hand in hand. We offer a number of new programs and courses in the intellectual property and innovation space, including a brand new IP certificate program that we just launched. We're hoping to prepare Cleveland Marshall students to be leaders in the future of law. So for all students that are listening, I encourage you to look into our intellectual property um, program and for employers to consider our students in this field. I look forward to moderating the innovation law panel today and to serving, serving Cleveland Marshall College of Law as we prepare its students for the future in health law, innovation and beyond. Thank you. Professor Laser, thank you very much. I'm also very proud to introduce today one of our star students. Brandy Davis is the president of the Health Law Society uh, and uh, also helped plan this conference. Brandy, we'd love to hear from you. Thank you, Dean Fisher. Um, so it's it's a pleasure to be here today with, with all of you and we're glad that you decided to come and join us at um, what we hope to be um, an annual thing. Um, in our health law program overall, it provides students continually with all sorts of opportunities, some of which Professor Majet mentioned. Um, for instance, also I'd like to add that we've been able to attend conferences um, related to health law, healthcare compliance, um, and also uh, continually to develop ourselves in our field. So thank you again. It's been a pleasure to serve as a student member on this planning committee, and we'd like to welcome you and hope you um, take home something from our conference today. Randy, thank you. Well, last but certainly not least is the person who really conceived the idea of this conference and was uh, the main organizer working very closely with the faculty co-chairs, Professor Majette and Professor Laser. Uh, Kim Bixenstein is the health law and policy leader in residence at Cleveland Marshall College of Law, the first ever uh, to hold that position. And when I tell you her bio, you'll understand why. Uh, Kim uh, started out after graduating from the University of Chicago Law School as a partner at the Cleveland law firm, or I should say maybe the global law firm of Jones Day. Uh, but soon she was snatched away by TRW where she became chief litigation counsel and vice president uh, at TRW. And then she was stolen again by university hospitals where she became uh, the uh, deputy general counsel and vice president, and then was promoted to chief compliance officer of university hospitals leading the compliance and ethics program. Uh, she worked at University Hospital for 16 years until she formed her own uh, mediation firm with her husband, Bart, who I had the privilege to practice law with for a number of years. Uh, Kim is now a professional mediator and arbitrator with ex expertise in health law, medical malpractice, employment, uh, and a variety of other areas. Kim, thank you for your leadership today, and it's all yours. Thank you so much, Dean Fisher. It's a pleasure, and it's a great privileged to serve as leader in residence for health law and policy for Cleveland Marshall Law School and as chair of this conference. As Professor Majette noted, Cleveland Marshall College of Law has the tremendous advantage of being in close proximity to some of the highest quality and most innovative healthcare institutions in the country. And these institutions provide excellent employment and extern opportunity, externship opportunities for our students. We have speakers today from a number of these outstanding institutions, such as the Cleveland Clinic, um, my former employer, University Hospitals of Cleveland, Metro Health uh, System, and St. Vincent Charity Hospital, as well as other distinguished speakers from this area and around the country. So I hope and trust you'll find this conference today informative and stimulating. I wanna thank the members of the planning committee and you'll see a slide in a moment with the names of those members and also um, the hard work and assistance of some staff from the law school, in particular, Jill Natron and Elaine Terman, 
as well as Susan Beach from the Cleveland Metro Bar Association, who is providing technical support for this conference. Before we move to our first panel discussion on healthcare disparities and the pandemic, I'm gonna give you a few instructions for the conference. Uh, first, for those lawyers who are seeking continuing legal education credit, in order to get credit, um, there are certain requirements that the Ohio Supreme Court imposes. And so we will be giving out five codes during this conference, we'll be giving them both orally and uh, in writing on slides. Please listen for these codes and mark them down. All attendees today will be receiving an electronic evaluation form from Cleveland Marshall Law School. If you're seeking continuing legal education credit, you need to put down those codes on the evaluation form and submit it back to the law school. The law school will then take um, responsibility for getting the number of credit hours you attended today to the Ohio Supreme Court. If you are a lawyer out of state, you follow the same procedure, mark down the codes, put them on your evaluation form, and then the law school will send you a certificate of attendance. We encourage you to submit questions throughout the conference using the Q&A function. The chat function is disabled, but um, you can submit your questions and the moderators will be looking for your questions and will address them with the panelists. Uh, our keynote speaker, Greg Shapiro, will be doing the same. Finally, and last but not least, if you're interested in learning more about the topics we're discussing today, the Cleveland Metropolitan Bar Association is having a medical legal summit April 29th through May 1st. Uh, they're covering some of the same topics that we're doing today, including vaccine hesitancy and telemedicine and COVID-19. So I'm putting in a little plug for them. So uh, without further ado, I'm gonna turn this over to the healthcare disparities uh, panel and the moderator is Shannon Jurse, the general counsel at St. Vincent Charity Hospital. Thank you very much. Shannon, okay. I think you can begin. Okay, thank you, Dean. Um, and thank you, Kim. Um, my name is Shannon Juris. I'm the general counsel for St. Vincent Charity Medical Center. And I am also a proud graduate of Cleveland Marshall. Um, I won't tell you when I graduated, but I've been a lawyer for over 30 years, so you could do the math. I'm very pleased to be um, moderating this first presentation, this first panel for this medical legal uh, summit. Um, we are gonna be discussing health disparities in the pandemic. Uh, we, I will be welcoming two doctors and two lawyers. So I think the, this panel is going to be um, very, very interesting about talking about health disparities in our community and around the country. So first I'm going to introduce the doctors. We'll do the doctors first and then the lawyers. Um, first I'm going to introduce Dr. Greg Hall, who is one of my colleagues at St. Vincent. He is a native Clevelander. He is a graduate of Williams College and Medical College of Ohio. He's a Cleveland Clinic trained internal medicine specialist for over 25 years. The associate professor of both internal medicine and integrative medical sciences at Northeastern Ohio Medical University. He was also uh, the governor appointed member of the Ohio Commission on Minority Health 
and has served as chairman for many, many years and board president of the Cuyahoga County Board of Health. So thank you for joining us, Dr. Hall. We also have with us Dr. James Misak, who is the medical director of Metro Health Systems Institute for Hope. Dr. Misak is a graduate of the Northwestern University School of Medicine and completed his family medicine residency at Cook County Hospital in Chicago. Uh, he works for the, uh, the Metro's Institute for Hope, which is Health, Opportunity, Partnership, and Empowerment. The Institute leads Metro Health's comprehensive coordinated commitment to identify and act on the social determinants of health as a critical component of achieving optimal individual and community health needs. So join me in welcoming both Dr. Hall and Dr. Misak, uh, and we'll start the panel with Dr. Hall. And Dr. Hall is going to be doing a PowerPoint presentation as well. Thank you, um, Shannon. Um, let me share my screen first. All right, I'm happy to uh, be here. I'm assuming we see, see my screen well. Very good. I'm happy to be here and to talk about this timely topic. Uh, we've been talking about health disparities and and COVID-19 has been an issue now for over a year now. And so what we've seen since early on is that too many African-Americans have been dying at a disproportionately high rate from uh, COVID-19. And so those articles started you know, in, in May and, and um, April and May of last year, and the trends have certainly continued. Um, articles have been written to sort of bring attention to it. And it's been nice because we've had the opportunity to talk about how really the health disparities that were there the entire time um, and really just kind of be brought to the front. And uh, of course, Dr. Fauci was the first person to sort of say that. So let's look a minute at the, at the data overall. So this form, this looks at the uh, incidence of the death of due to COVID-19 based on race or ethnicity. And the big long yellow bar at the top is indigenous Americans or native Americans. And so they have the highest death rate, um, you know, in terms of uh, per 100,000. And that green bar that's third down, that's the African-American um, bar. And then the blue bar that's two more, two more down are Pacific Islanders. And see, that's sort of, they're basically away from the pack from uh, where um, uh, white Americans are or Asian or even Latino uh, Americans. And so you see that disproportionate uh, impact and that it's been growing. If you look at this graph from uh, December 8th, going through the beginning of March, those deaths have continued to go up. And so um, if the issue and in, in with uh, again Native Americans significantly higher than the rest of the pack, not so much of an issue here in Ohio because of our lower population, but nationally, this is a definitely an issue. And so when you look at how many deaths per 100,000 is kind of how, you know, in the, us in the medical world sort of look at things, they have 256 um, deaths per 100,000. African Americans in second place with 180 deaths per 100,000. You can kind of see the rest of them there. And so we, in order to put that into perspective, and don't even bother trying to look at this slide, because I want to zoom in on one part. If you look at the death rate from prostate cancer for whites and blacks, or rectal uh, colon cancer, or lung cancer, you see lung cancer is the highest, 64 or 54 per 100,000. So compare that 64 to 150 to 250, that's the impact that uh, COVID-19 is having. And so the money that we spend on smoking cessation and you know health and things related to, to keeping lung cancer and colon cancer, that's just paling in comparison to the impact uh, of COVID-19. And so if you look at the country, even the darker greens are the higher rates per 100,000. And so uh, if you look at uh, the state of New York, that's even higher than 400 deaths per 100,000. Or if you look down at the states of, of Louisiana, Mississippi, they're also darker. Our state, thankfully, is a little bit lighter. So that, but it's still in the greater than 100 rates per 100,000. So that, that even the differences based on region are, are significant. And so for a, for a, a study to me, and for a time in January, uh, COVID-19 was the number one cause of death, just ab above heart disease, above cancer, above you know, dementia. It's just amazing and it's way ahead of number one. And so the impact has been stunning. Um, as Shannon mentioned, I'm on the Board of Health and we've been working since the beginning on, on following this. And so this graph just shows the rate 
of illness for um, uh, um, actually the rate of cases for, for uh, COVID-19. And you've seen that go down and this actually runs through uh, March 6th. And so let's continue to, it's sort of plateauing right now. Um, the actually updated information is coming out today, but, um, but, it, but we're, we're, we're in a good place compared to where we were in November and December. And so if you look at the vaccine status now, and this uh, it was updated as of yesterday, uh, the number of people that, that we've been able to vaccine, actually 72,000 in the last 24 hours, which is amazing and a really big day on, uh, uh, on St. Patrick's Day. It was a lot of people was back, were vaccinated that day. And so we're at just about 22% of the state vaccinated. But if we look at who specifically is getting vaccinated in, the, uh, in, in our county, we'll see it's disproportionately women, uh, 60% to 40%. And you see the age range is going out there with a significant number between 60 and 69. And at the race in your bottom uh, left-hand corner, you see 75% has been um, white, 14% uh, has been black. And so uh, as we're in a, a county that is 30% African-American to have 14% only be vaccinated at this point, that's a, a significant uh, disparity. So African-Americans are lagging behind due to inc uh, decreased life expectancy. So we started vaccinating people at the, at the, all the older ages. And so again, if, we, if African-Americans have a lower life expectancy, there's, there's less, fewer of them to actually be eligible. Uh, there's an increased chronic diseases. And so that impairs people's ability to get in and out and get around. Uh, there was a vaccine aversion uh, that I could talk about for an hour. And, and some of that's due to conspiracy theories that we've all seen in our social network. And some of it's due to mistrust of medicine and public health. And so African-Americans have a history of abuse at the hands of medical science here in the US, you know, not starting with the Tuskegee uh, syphilis uh, incident, but really starting much earlier with grave robbing from medical schools uh, for, uh, for dissection. And, and J. Marion Sims, actually um, the father, so-called father of gynecology, perfecting his, 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 a lot of his, um, his, his surgical techniques on unanesthetized slave girls. And then even recently in, um, um, in uh, Virginia, the first heart transplant was done in a man who fell off of a three foot wall and hit his head. And within 24 hours, they had harvested his heart. And so these stories have been circulating in African-American families, including uh, racial uh, zone, uh, redlining was done even in the name of public health to prevent the spread of communicable diseases. But it said black should be quarantined to slums. And so these issues, are, 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 are ingrained in, in a lot of black communities. Um, and so blacks aren't running to get the COVID-19. And then there's also these other barriers. A lot of it's due to this um, medical abuse. And so we're struggling right now to try to be, be equitable and fair in our delivery of the vaccine and our delivery of care. So those would be my opening statements. Um, I appreciate it. Thank you, Dr. Hall. Um, you know, the statistics are really stunning as we hit the first year anniversary that we even heard um, of the disease COVID. And now we had hypothetically discussed, I think, for years whether there even were any disparities of health. And now we see it immediately in full view. Um, so, Dr. Misak, we can let's hear from you now. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. And thank you for uh, giving me the opportunity to speak to you. Um, I think uh, what Dr. Hall and I are talking about. Um, really reveals the fact that, that COVID-19 didn't create health disparities. What it did was it revealed them and exaggerated them. So, so one of the ways that COVID is referred to is the lightning bolt that illuminates the horizon. The disparities have always been there. COVID-19 has just made them more apparent to all of us. Um, there's, as, as everyone on this call knows, there are many things that drive health and actually very few of the drivers of health reside under the purview of the healthcare system. We're kind of here all the way here over on the right. But these factors here, which we collectively refer to as the social determinants of health, have a much greater impact on the health of our patients in our communities than the healthcare that our um, outstanding clinical care systems deliver. In fact, in Cleveland, there's, there's as much as a 23 year life expectancy disparity between neighborhoods that are literally two miles apart. So it's not because the air in Lyndhurst is cleaner than the air in Huff, although that might be true. It has to do with all the non-clinical factors that affect patients' health, their social, socioeconomic environment, their behaviors, their physical environment, 
Those are the things that impact health far more than the clinical care we provide. Um, there is a website called County Health Rankings that is um, provided by the University of Wisconsin and the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. And what this website does is it takes all the counties in every state and it force ranks them against one another on two parameters, one being health outcomes, meaning how long you live and how well you live, and the other being health factors, the social determinants of health that I previously talked about. And the news for Cuyahoga County, unfortunately, is not good. Cuyahoga County ranks 75th out of 88 counties in Ohio for health outcomes, a uh, lower number is better. And we rank 70th out of 88 Ohio counties for health factors, even though we have outstanding clinical care. And unfortunately for us, these numbers have been dropping over the course of the past several years. So we have some significant health challenges and health disparities uh, within Cuyahoga County. What I'd like to talk to you about a little bit now is a report that was just recently released from the National Vital Statistics System, which is a division of the Centers for Disease Control. And what they did is they put out some provisional life expectancy estimates for the first six months of 2020, January through June, and compared them to calendar year 2019. And what we found, not surprisingly, is with close to a half a million COVID deaths, life expectancy at birth overall in the United States has declined by one year from 2019 to 2020. Now, just to put this in perspective, that is a stunning amount of movement for a short period of time. These numbers usually inch at glacial paces. If there's a change in a month life expectancy from year to year, demographers kind of you know, pick up their ears and want to know what's going on. So a change in a year is a dramatic change uh, for such a short period of time. And what you see here is that the decrease in life expectancy was not borne proportionally by all groups. Um, whites, in whites, the, the decrease in life expectancy was a little bit less than a year, but in blacks, it was almost three years. And when you look at this by male and female, you can see that black men have had the greatest decrease in life expectancy between 2019 and 2020, uh, three years compared to um, less than a year for, for white men. So while everyone's life expectancy has decreased as a result of COVID and not just COVID, but all of the epiphenomenon around COVID that relate to health, uh, Blacks and Hispanics have borne a disproportionate share of this burden. Um, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau recently released, recently released a study that they called Housing Insecurity in the COVID-19 Pandemic. One of the things we know in looking at social determinants of health is that safe, stable housing is one of the most powerful factors in indicating whether someone will be healthy or not healthy. Not surprisingly, COVID had an enormous impact in, in employment. Um, this is when all the lockdown orders started to go into effect in March and April everybody's unemployment went up. As time has gone by, unemployment has gone down, but you can see that for Blacks and Hispanics, unemployment in December of 2020 is still significantly higher than among whites and Asians. As a result, not surprisingly, um, more Black and Hispanic households are behind on rent and housing payments than our whites and Asians um, over calendar year 2020. And you can see Blacks are in the pink bar here um, over a quarter of renters and close to a fifth of homeowners are behind on either rent or mortgage housing payments. And not surprisingly, um, more disproportionately more Blacks uh, believe that they're going to be evicted as a result of being behind their rent or mortgage payments. So, you know, we can see how these disadvantages compound. Um, it's not, again, it's not just COVID, it's loss of employment. Um, its loss of income, its potential loss of housing. All of these things contribute to the health disparities that we're seeing. This is a fascinating study that looked at the impact of lifting eviction moratoriums on the incidence and mortality of COVID-19 in 44 states. Now, I'm going to try and walk you through this. It's a little bit complicated, but what, this, what they did is they looked at 44 states in total, 27 of them had lifted their eviction moratoriums at some point during the COVID pandemic 
17 states maintained them throughout the pandemic and during the time that this study was conducted. And what these graphs are, this is a ratio of the incidence of COVID infections and the mortality of COVID infections comparing the 27 states that lifted their eviction moratoriums to the 17 states that maintained them. And this dotted line here sort of represents time zero for each state that lift, each of the 17 states that lifted its eviction moratorium. So what you see here is prior to lifting the eviction moratorium, the states that lifted it and didn't lift it had fairly similar mortality. So they were fairly similar at that point. But once eviction moratoriums were lifted, the states that lifted their eviction moratoriums saw an increase in both the incidence of COVID-19 infections and the incidence of COVID-19 deaths compared to states that did not lift their eviction moratoriums. Um, this ratio of COVID infections between moratorium lifting states and non-moratorium lifting states was 2.1 um, at 16 weeks. And the mortality difference, the mortality ratio difference was 5.4. So what does this mean in terms of absolute numbers? Again, this graph is a ratio uh, comparing the states that lifted their eviction moratoriums with, with the states that did not. And after a period of time, the states that have lifted their eviction moratoriums collectively saw over 430,000 excess COVID in, uh, infections and almost 11,000 excess COVID deaths. Again, reinforcing the importance of safe, stable housing to the health of our population. And also looking at the policy impacts of things like lifting eviction moratoriums and the effect they have on the health of the population. As Dr. Hall said, there is a um, ignominious history of um, racism, both within the healthcare system and obviously in society at large. And these conditions combine both to create disparate health outcomes for communities of color, as well as disparate health outcomes and disparate health impacts for COVID-19. So this really is a series of compounding disadvantages that the COVID-19 um, pandemic, again, has illuminated for us, but by no means has caused. These, these have been, these conditions have well preceded COVID-19 and they will well follow COVID-19 unless we make some significant policy and practice. So what are we doing at Metro Health? Uh, in 2019, Metro Health established the Institute for Hope. It's an acronym that stands for Health Opportunity Partnership and Empowerment. And this is our um, system level commitment to address the health related social needs and the social determinants of health that keep many of our communities from living the healthiest life possible. Um, we were very busy in 2020, as were many, many institutions. Um, we did some direct service um, in terms of food delivery, um, care packages, um, reaching out to people with social isolation, um, trying to address some of the non-clinical factors that our patients were facing that were exacerbated by the COVID-19 pandemic. And we will continue to do this work for as long as necessary. But I think it's important to put this work into context. Um, this is a graph that shows how do we move beyond sort of the day-to-day -day work that we do to really create the conditions for healthy communities. If you look here downstream, this is what Dr. Hall and I do every day. We diagnose, we treat, we counsel. Um, and this actually is where COVID-19 vaccines sit. It's a very downstream intervention to the pandemic and a critical one but a downstream one. Moving a little bit more upstream, we start to say, how can we address the health-related social needs of the patients that come to us? Things like food insecurity, housing insecurity, uh, transportation insecurity. And that's what we're attempting to do at the Institute for Hope, as well as many other institutions. But really, the biggest impact is going to be here, upstream. Um, what policies, what procedures, you know, what spending priorities are we going to put into place that will have hopefully um, positive impacts on the midstream and downstream ways that we um, see the health of our population in our communities. And with that, I will stop and thank you all for your attention. Well, thank you, Dr. Mintz. Those are very powerful numbers. Um, 
I mean, just to think of this unprecedented pa pandemic and a public policy that resulted in a, uh, a, an increased number of deaths in such a short period of time. Um, and I hope discussions like this are, will be going on all over the country so that we can decide how we're gonna address them. Um, so next we're gonna hear from our lawyers and hopefully talk about some public policy uh, that may be able to help us address these, this disparity. Um, we, so first we're gonna hear from um, Dr. Majed, Gwendolyn Roberts Majed. She, you already heard some of her introduction. She's got her undergraduate degree from Emory and um, her LLM from George Washington University and she has an LLM in global health. Um, she has, was a global health scholar at Georgetown and has been a healthcare law and policy professor for many years and has written extensively on issues involving public health healthcare policy and healthcare reform. So thank you for joining us, Professor Majed. We're also gonna hear from Colleen Cotter, who I think is very well known to most of the people who are uh, participating in this, um, uh, this consultation today. Um, she has been the executive director of the Legal Aid Society for 15 years. She got her JD from Indiana University School of Law in Bloomington and her BA from the University of Notre Dame. So she's been a Clevelander for some time. She's the chair of the St. Luke's Foundation Board and the president of United Way of Greater Cleveland. She's also a member of the Cleveland Metropolitan Bar Association, United Way Board, and the Cleveland Marshall College of Law Visiting Committee. Um, she's, a, she's very deeply involved in our community and we're uh, very pleased to have her speak to Legal Aid's response to the pandemic. So Professor Majette, we'll start with you. Professor, we can't, we can't hear you. Yes. There you go. Yes. Um, so I want to talk about um, one aspect of the response to COVID in the United States. Um, so both of the physicians have talked to us extensively about social determinants of health. And so I just want to add to that conversation that the focus and this emphasis is something that is recognized at the international and a national level. And I want to talk just about the Commission on Social Determinants of Health for just one moment, because what that does is it gives us a framework to understand equity from a worldwide perspective. This commission was created by the World Health Organization to focus in on social determinants of health and health equity, and to think about improving people's daily living conditions, tackling an equitable distribution of power, money, and resources, and measuring and understanding the extent of the problem. Um, and so the goal is to have a universal healthcare system, to take equity into consideration for all policy systems and programs, and to continue to monitor what you're doing from a health equity perspective. Um, and in the international community, these ideas about equity, equality, and non-discrimination are some key ideas. And I want to tie that to some of the efforts that occurred during the pandemic. Again, equity is eliminating disparities and health major determinants that are systematically associated with underlying social disadvantage. That's from the World Health Organization. Locally from the Institute of Medicine, equity is providing health care to all individuals in a manner that does not vary because of quality, personal characteristics, such as gender, ethnicity, and social economic status. So the seminal question that we have to ask is whether the state or country action is creating a system that reduces health care disparities and promotes equity. Uh, so I'm going to be looking at this through the paradigm of post-acute care um, and access that people of color had during the pandemic. And when we talk about post-acute care, I'm talking about skilled nursing care, physical, occupational, and speech therapy, medical, social work, and home health aid services. Uh, in 2018, about 3.4 million individuals were using these services. Um, and that what we want is to have home health that is ideal, patient-centered, holistic, sophisticated, individualized care at home for people with serious and disabling conditions. Um, and to provide this care, we're going to make sure that it's an interdisciplinary effort that you're taking into consideration the palliative team, the um, geriatric team, 
You want to make sure that you can transition the people up and down care the way that they need it. Um, and that when if they need to move from hospital to home, that you can do that. Um, and you're going to use advanced information to, um, technology. So thinking about things we'll talk, talk about later, telemedicine. So when we think about home health, there were disparities in this area pre-COVID. Um, and so I wanted to talk about that just a little bit. Um, and we call that medical redlining, basically meaning that healthcare providers would decide, like they did with housing, that they weren't going to serve certain neighborhoods. These neighborhoods were generally neighborhoods of color. So sometimes you would have providers that they would provide care in one neighborhood, um, but they would not provide those same services to people of color who were nearby. In the 90s, um, the Office of Civil Rights, they sued several large home health care providers for engaging in this type of conduct. And more recently, we've seen with the Medicare population, this is a report that came out, that those same type of disparities exist with respect to patients receiving home health care and is based upon their uh, race. You see that it takes longer for people, Black African Americans, to receive home health care services in comparison to white. The type of payment used, so um, Medicaid, which provides the lowest level of reimbursement, those patients have to wait the longest to receive care. In contrast, individuals who have fee-for-service, it does not take as long. Also, uh, this study showed that people who lived in neighborhoods, poorer neighborhoods where there was higher unemployment, higher poverty, it also took longer for them to receive care. Uh, so one of the things that I thought about and you have to think about is, so what did the Office of Civil Rights do during the COVID-19 pandemic? Well, I went and looked at their materials. And so when you look at the materials from the office, what you see is that um, they are responsible for enforcing Title VI. Um, and so in March during the pandemic, they released a um, bulletin. Um, in that bulletin, it did not focus in on race. It did focus in on two very important vulnerable groups. It focused in on disabled individuals and it focused in on individuals that um, had language barriers. And if you think about it, this makes sense from the nature of the illness as described by the healthcare um, care professionals. And with respect to language in March, we were concerned about individuals from other countries um, and in certain populations. So they made sure that all of the information that they provided was given in at least 16 languages. It wasn't until July that the Office of Civil Rights issued a bulletin dealing with the issue of race. And so in that July bulletin, they specifically mentioned Title VI, which prohibits discrimination based upon race, color, and national origin in programs and activities that receive federal financial assistance. They specifically mentioned this. Um, and they also gave specific examples of conduct that would be prohibited, one of which um, includes not serving, um, providing home health aid services in certain neighborhoods. Now, one of the things we have to think about with respect to uh, approach and how this is beneficial, it helps at a higher level, a structural level, to have a government agency putting out information and educating the public about how they should behave because that prevents harm as opposed to an individual having to sue. That is not necessarily at the population level. What we would want is to educate providers about what these laws are. So this is a preventive measure that is uh, important um, that the department uh, did take and I applaud them for doing that. Um, also in thinking about um, providing care in the home. The other piece we have to think about is who is helping to provide this care. Of course, you have professionals, but you also have family members that have to um, help. And so um, one of the things that some scholars talk about is next friend risk, which is the risk of becoming responsible for someone else's care. 
And so this also brings up ideas about social determinants. Do people, family members have the medical training? Do they have the wherewithal to be able to stay home and help with their family because they have economic stability? What about their physical health? Do they have the time? Do they have access to durable metal equipment? What about health literacy? So those are some additional complicating factors that you have to take into consideration when thinking about um, the delivery of home health care uh, during the pandemic. Um, so CMS also um, engaged in certain waivers to allow this home health care um, to occur. Um, they got rid of certain things like discharge planning and discharging to appropriate setting. Um, those were some of the things that they did get um, waived under the 1135 waivers. Um, and they also changed some of the limitations so that healthcare providers themselves weren't being overly exposed to patients. And so they allowed um, telemedicine visits uh, with home health aides and they changed the requirement for in-person on-site supervision to allow nurse um, practitioners to do that via visual um, supervision. Um, the Cleveland Clinic was used these types of services um, to help take care of their patients. And this, they were very successful in doing it. Um, they also had a special program dealing with people who had COVID and that was also very successful. Uh, Professor Misek just talked to you about what Metro Health was doing. And so I won't go into consideration with that, but that it can be paired with home health services and is beneficial. And the final piece that I just wanted to share that um, CMS did is they also changed some of the rules to actually provide acute care level um, at, of care at home. So they waive some requirements. So you basically are having a hospital in your home. Um, and some of the hospitals that took advantage of that include the Mayo Clinic. Um, I don't have on this slide, but the Cleveland Clinic was also an entity that took advantage of that additional type of service. So we see one of the benefits of the pandemic is that healthcare uh, has changed and it can be beneficial to certain groups as long as the different um, agencies are working together and they keep health equity at the forefront of what they're doing. Thank you. Well, thank you, Professor Majed, for um, highlighting some of the pu public policy responses. Uh, you know, in addition to responding from a medical standpoint, um, I think the responses, the public policy responses, CMS responses, and then the healthcare, there's been a lot of collaboration locally and nationally as uh, hospitals and healthcare uh, entities have pivoted to respond as best they could. So thank you for highlighting that. Um, so Colleen, we'd like to hear from you next about how uh, legal aid and uh, public defenders and how the lawyers have, have been able to pivot themselves to respond to this pandemic. Thank you, Shannon. Um, and following these, uh, the medical professors um, professionals and academic is a little challenging. I'm going to try to bring things to my world, which is very practical and on the ground here in Cleveland at the legal aid and how lawyers can really change um, our systems and address uh, social determinants of health. And one thing I want to um, note is that we've learned a lot clearly uh, from uh, the pandemic and it has, as Dr. Hall and Dr. Mizak showed, it has um, shown and exhibited the inequities in our society and hopefully the pandemic will come to an end, but those inequities will not end unless we change things. And so I wanna talk about two ways of changing things and how what we're doing in Cleveland uh, to address social determinants of health. One is a service delivery model that we use um, to address those uh, health inequities. We have medical legal partnerships. It's actually a national model and Cleveland is at the forefront of that national model. The Legal Aid Society of Cleveland has medical legal partnerships with uh, the Metro Health System, with St. Vincent Charity Hospital, and with university hospitals. And this model shows that working together, doctors and lawyers can uh, reduce health disparities and increase health equity. 
Lawyers work side by side with doctors to identify where is the issue less about treatment, uh, as Dr. Mizak showed that chart with how things impact health, where is it less about medical treatment and more about the circumstances of that individual, secure housing, stable income, access to education, uh, reducing inequities. Uh, we know that the, the stresses of being poor and the stresses of living with racism are very unhealthy for people. So lawyers can often re remove those barriers to health by uh, ensuring that people have access to public benefits and education, ensuring they have access to unemployment, which has been a huge issue uh, during the pandemic. So that's one model and we've, we've seen that in fact, uh, the health outcomes are improved when lawyers and doctors are working side by side to remove those barriers. The other issue that I wanted to talk about briefly is about shelter. Uh, and um, Dr. Hall and Dr. Mizak talked about shelter and the impact of uh, the pandemic on housing stability. And in the, the city of Cleveland passed legislation in 2019, establishing a right to counsel in evictions. Cleveland is the fourth city in the country, only the fourth city in the country to establish such a right, but it is a national movement. The idea that people are housing instable in our country is simply not okay. Um, and we all know that the home is the heart of so many things. If without a stable home, um, it puts you at higher risk during the pandemic, clearly, as Dr. Myasek showed in his charts, but it also destabilizes um, education and employment and um, impacts the trajectory of children and adults. So Cleveland passed the right to counsel in evictions uh, that took effect July 1st of 2020, just as the Cleveland moratorium on eviction was ending. Um, so we still have the, the CDC's moratorium on evictions in place for a little bit longer, but we don't have a state moratorium. We haven't had local moratoria for um, since last July. Um, in Cleveland, if households with low income, so below 100% of the federal poverty guidelines, which is about $26,000 for a family of four, and where there are children in the household, those households qualify for a lawyer in evictions. So it's a small, it's only a third of evictions that qualify under this right. And Legal Aid in partnership with the United Way of Greater Cleveland are charged with implementation of this program. We found in the first six months of implementation that where we were seeking to prevent the eviction, we actually were successful in preventing eviction in 93% of those cases, 93%. And in some situations, the tenant doesn't wanna stay, but instead needs time to move so that they, are, they don't lose their things, they're able to move to other stable housing. And in those situations, we were able to secure more time to move in 83% of cases. So the effectiveness of a program like right to counsel and evictions is clear. Uh, we've seen the data out of New York City, which is a couple of years ahead of us, um, to show that over time, fewer evictions are filed. Um, housing conditions will improve because lawyers can bring counterclaims to address housing conditions. So the housing stock will improve, people will stay housed, um, communities will be stable, there will be less churn in our communities, and people can support each other, which is another um, item that uh, the previous preventers, presenters identified, the social connections are so important to health, but we can't, um, but those social connections are broken when people have to move out of neighborhoods because they're evicted. So policy change like right to um, counsel in evictions can make a significant difference to health long-term, both during the pandemic and after the pandemic. Again, the right is only in the city of Cleveland um, at this point in time. So thank you, Shannon. Thank you. Um, we have a few extra minutes. So first, uh, before we move on to questions, um, the code for those looking for CLEs, the code for this session is pandemic, not a surprise. Um, so for those of you who want to get some credit, just remember that the code for this session is pandemic and um, we'll send, they'll be, that'll be posted as well. Um, we have one question. If there's anybody else who has questions, 
feel free to put them in now. And then we're gonna, I'm gonna ask our panelists to kind of sum everything up. The question um, from Gordon Gant is, uh, how has technology, particularly telehealth, impacted the underserved communities? Have these tools improved access to care for underserved or exacerbated the disparities? So excellent question. So why don't we go in order, Dr. Hall, do you, do you wanna comment? Yeah, I, I, I think in my practice, it's, it's made it a little bit worse um, uh, and, and it's un uncovered the, the lack of technology in my older patients, you know, not having a camera on their phone or not having a, uh, the ability to use a laptop if they, if they have a laptop. And if you have that, you know, just the dynamics of trying to get a Zoom meeting going with the patient, uh, you, you see us struggle, you know. <laughs> Uh, so it's it's um, it's really a, it's not as easy. I thought, boy, I'll be able to see some patients. It's not I'm not able to do that. And then the quality is it's a little bit down in terms of you know how do you determine if someone has bronchitis or pneumonia through the phone? And so those issues. And I know that's what people sort of emergently have. You know, how do you determine if you have a urinary tract infection through the phone? So um, it the access is there, but the people don't have the material. They don't have the bandwidth. To, to use it. So I think that's actually, again, widening uh, disparities. Thank you, Dr. Mizak. What has been your experience? Well, I think the experience of the Metro Health System actually is that it's been both. Um, like many health systems in March, we made a dramatic pivot from in-person visits to virtual visits. And uh, still a significant number of our visits are conducted virtually. However, most of those telehealth visits are actually conducted by the telephone. So um, Dr. Hall's right that when it comes to video visits, I think that uh, we see some significant disparities in access. But one of the ways we've tried to bridge that is through the use of telephone visits. Now, obviously anything we do virtual has its limitations, right? We can't touch the patient. We can't get lab tests, we can't get x-rays. So what we're able to offer in a virtual environment, whether it's telephone or video, is more limited than what we can offer in person, but at least it is some level of access. Um, and I will say that I think our most successful pivot has been our COVID hotline. We um, established very quickly in March a free telephone advice, nurse advice COVID hotline for anybody who wanted to use it. And for people who had symptoms concerning for COVID, they were then um, connected with a healthcare provider who could actually order the COVID test for the patient they have done. And uh, we have done tens of thousands of visits since March of 2020 uh, using that. So I think in that regard, so I think in some ways telehealth reduces disparities and in other ways it exacerbates them. Well, and Shannon, if I can comment from sure. the um, legal perspective, uh, I think that I would agree with Dr. Mizak that it's um, remote uh, legal work is increases disparities and decreases it both. And it really depends on the individual. And so all of our courts are different in terms of their ability to have remote hearings. Some courts have operated fully in person, others have been fully virtual and many have had a combination, a hybrid. Um, and we have found with our clients who are all people with low income that some people have good internet and good devices and other people have only their cell phone or maybe not that at all. And so I think as a as a community, uh, increasing broadband access is incredibly important. The devices are not as expensive. It's the broadband that is problematic, right? Um, so one of the things that we have done is um, purchased a bunch of Chromebooks with internet access that we loan out to clients so that our clients can engage in a virtual hearing and remain safe uh, from uh, exposure to COVID. Um, but going forward, we really want to move to a place where we assess our clients' capacity to use uh, technology to engage with us and with the courts so that we can choose the right um, mechanism for engagement for each individual. Thank you. And professor? So I was going to say, I have not seen any data on the home health use or the um, acute care at home model that specifically um, has broken down that information and that data by disparities. But what I would say is that when I've looked at the literature for telemedicine just in general, the issues that have been identified are what the literature is reflecting. 
that there are disparities for older people and minority communities with respect to access and being able to use the technology. So there's a literacy piece of it. It's a lack of equipment um, that is driving that as well as the lack of broadband. Um, and so those are some of the um, differences that you do see with respect to telemedicine in general in the literature. Well, thank you. Okay, well, um, we have just a couple more minutes. So I just want to, uh, there's one more question and then I wanted everybody to comment again. Um, there's so much information to unpack in this discussion and I really appreciate all the panelists. I think that, you know, with this pandemic, um, our country and the world, it's gonna take us a long time to assess our response. And we hear in the news how we're assessing, you know, just our general medical response to the, to the, um, to the pandemic. But I think this really demonstrates that the disparities of health and my two takeaways that were just so stunning were um, part from Dr. Hall and part from Dr. Mizak. The vaccination rate in Cuyahoga County, um, you know, the white population, 77% of our vaccines have been from white citizens who have access to computers and, and can be on their computers for a, a period of time to get appointments. Um, and then the other really stark um, statistic that Dr. Mizak presented was that it's the increased mortality and it's, it's not morbidity, it's mortality. The increased direct increase in deaths related to the, um, uh, this, the moratorium on, um, on evictions. So those are my two strong takeaways. And as Dr. Misak said, this data is like the lightning bolt that illuminated the horizon. So our question is, the need for lawyers and physicians to work together to de decrease health disparities was echoed throughout the entire presentation. So thank you for that. Um, what comments do each of you have, or as we're looking to the horizon, what would be one thing you would want our community to focus on um, to, to first admit that we have there are health disparities? I think this, this should settle the argument that there is a question that does exist. And then what would be your one takeaway or your one thing you would want to do uh, as a community going forward? Dr. Hall? Yeah, thanks. It's a, it's a hard, tough question, right? I mean, it's a this is a situation we've been in for a long time, and 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 doctors and lawyers don't always work well together, right? <laughs> and so, um, and and so, you know, trying to bridge that gap is is critically important because, from my perspective, as someone who you know, I I wrote a book on the clinical care of African Americans, and there's a lot of clinical differences in the care of African Americans that. Frankly, a lot of providers don't don't know about, and, and they should. And, you know, and if you if you have a population of patients that are significant, that you know, you should know the best practices. And so, I think, you know, holding providers accountable for the care that they provide. I mean, even as a physician, I mean, it's hard to hear me say that, but that needs to that needs to happen because there are clinical differences that that, that providers should know, and there's bias issues that they should be aware of, and and that that's impacting. The quality of care. We don't have to go back to the Tuskegee syphilis. And, you know, we can go back to yesterday. There are people that had a bad experience at a hospital yesterday, all because of bias and racism, and the provider has no clue. Uh, and so I think so some kind of way to, to partner to try to help educate people, because that's the way we're going to be able to, you know, to provide more care. And then patients need to know about their own biases as well. So just trying to educate that it's not all this mean racist, you know, institution that's that, that beating down on you, but that also they play a part and can help to improve that relationship as well. Thank you. Dr. Mizak, closing statement. Um, I think that where uh, medicine and law can really partner in the future is in the support of a much more robust public health system. Um, one of the things that we've known is that we have underfunded public investment in public health for decades in this country. And as a result, our public health system was very poorly prepared to meet the pandemic. And some people are referring to COVID-19 as our starter pandemic. I mean, this is not going to be an isolated incident. This is going to happen again. Um, climate change, you know, we could spend a day talking about climate change, but, you know, there are going to be climate change driven pandemic infections in the future that we really need to be able to address with a much more robust public health system. And this is where I think, uh, you know, both from the public health law standpoint, making sure that public health has the legal authority it needs to do what it does and not be overridden by legislatures, such as is trying to be uh, accomplished in Ohio and ensuring the robust funding of a public health system, I think is a area of fruitful opportunity going forward. 
Okay. Thank you, Professor Majette. We have just a few seconds left. So my point would be very quick. I had two, but I'm only going to give you one. And so one of the things that I think it would be good is to have a independent um, commission to investigate um, the disparities that exist. And that independent commission would have a diverse professionals on it, including physicians, lawyers, public health lawyers, health law lawyers, public health physicians, preventive medicine physicians. I think that something like that would be good to do a deep dive, analyze the data and come up with a plan to help local communities and larger communities be able to be prepared for the next pandemic. Okay, thank you. Colleen, you wanna round us out? Just very briefly, I think if lawyers and doctors see that equity and justice are about health and health is about equity and justice, we can bridge that gap and uh, work together to change policy, to serve patients, clients, and create a healthier, healthier community. Thank you. And thank you all the panelists. Um, I think this was a very robust discussion, so thank you so much. And I will turn it back over to Kim Bixenstein. Okay, we're going to be starting in just about a couple of minutes, our next panel discussion on uh, privacy, ethical, and human resources issues relating to the pandemic. So please stay tuned.
Good morning, everyone. I'm Kim Bixenstein. I'm a lawyer and professional mediator. I co-own a mediation and arbitration firm with my husband, Bart, called Bixenstein Resolutions. And I have an extensive background in healthcare law and compliance, and I'm privileged to serve as the leader in residence for health law and policy for Cleveland Marshall College of Law. We're gonna be talking in this panel about some of the human resources, privacy and ethical issues relating to the pandemic. First, I'm going to let each of the panelists introduce themselves, starting with Anne-Marie Ahern. Thanks, Kim. My name is Anne-Marie Ahern. I'm an employment lawyer uh, for about the last 20 plus years. I primarily represent plaintiffs in employment disputes and I am a principal and board member at the Cleveland law firm of McCarthy, Lubbock, Crystal, and Lipman. Elizabeth. Hi, I'm Elizabeth Hammack. I have been privileged to work at University Hospital's law department for the last dozen years uh, with an exceptional team of lawyers there. Prior to that, I was at Kelsey Halter and Griswold. And before that, I was at Presenius Medical Care in Lexington, Massachusetts. And last but not least, Josh Kreitz. Sure. Hi, hi everybody. My name is Josh Kreitz. Uh, I'm a staff ethicist at the Cleveland Clinic and the Center for Bioethics here. Um, I've been um, in back to the clinic now for uh, coming up on five, about five and a half years or so. I did my, my fellowship training in clinical ethics at the, fellowship, at the clinic. Uh, and spent three years in the interim at Penn State Hershey College of Medicine. Uh, so happy to be here, happy to talk about this uh, difficult but important topic. As you can see everyone, we have a wonderful panel here. I'm gonna start uh, with Anne-Marie. Um, and I, I wanna add that Anne-Marie is also on the board of Cleveland Marshall College of Law and is being inducted into the Cleveland Marshall College of Law Alumni Hall of Fame. So congratulations, Amber. Thanks, Kim. So the whole world is focused now on getting COVID vaccines distributed and in the arms of um, people. And so as a lawyer who primarily represents employee uh, clients, what are some of the privacy, ethical, and human resources issues facing your clients with respect to COVID vaccinations? Well, I think I'll probably start with the most timely because, you know, the, the pandemic has, I think everybody can agree, has had a life of its own and different phases with different issues that have uh, had prominence uh, in our practices during given periods of time. And the issues that, you know, a year ago were prevalent are, are kind of behind us for the most part now. And so right now, the biggest issue really relates to mandatory or employer required vaccination policies. Um, and it's a really a, a fascinating topic. And I'll say that I, I gave an interview. Um, it's a fascinating topic and a controversial one. I gave an interview uh, to a morning television news station a few weeks ago, and they, they put it up on YouTube. And um, I've spoken about a lot of topics, some of which I view to be kind of controversial. I've never had so many comments um, about my interview. And so it was 450 comments, almost all of them were mean. Um, and so it was, uh, my, my 12 year old took great delight in reading uh, all of these uh, mean comments about what I was saying. Uh, but you know, the, uh, the issue really is, can we as employers um, uh, uh, mandate that our employees get vaccinated? And I think a lot of people and the reason for all of those comments are surprised to hear, yes, that as an employee, unless you have a union, as an employee, your employer can require you to be vaccinated. Um, and unless there's some legal basis, such as a religious, uh, sincerely held religious belief or a medical condition that would warrant some sort of accommodation, your employer very much can require you uh, to be vaccinated. And uh, another employer policy that uh, affects privacy uh, concerns is this issue about whether your employer can inquire as to your vaccination status. And, you know, I think most people think that's off limits. 
um, I have a right to privacy from my employer knowing my, my medical conditions. And under the ADA, generally that is true. But the EEOC in December issued guidance saying that when it comes to this issue, for, for this particular issue within this pandemic, you may, as an employer, make an inquiry uh, without it being a prohibited medical examination of employees as to their vaccination status. So there's a lot to unpack there, and I'm sure our other panelists have something to say about it, but in my mind, right now, this is the biggest issue that we're seeing in employment law as it relates to the pandemic. Elizabeth, um, talk to us about how University Hospitals has dealt with such, such issues um, relating to vaccination, disclosure of uh, vaccination status, disclosure of um, COVID status and mandatory vaccines. Thanks, Kim. Um, as uh, Emery indicated, this is an area that's quickly evolving. Um, and so the current um, state is that as a practical matter, there are not sufficient vaccines in hand uh, for all employees, even healthcare employees to be vaccinated. And the state has set out a very strict prioritization um, and we have protocols to follow it, particularly with respect to healthcare workers. Uh, and there was a window that has since closed. It, it looks as though in the next couple of weeks, um, it supply is certainly coming online as is a broader um, uh, uh, set of, of cohorts who will be eligible for vaccination. And so the conversation may change, but um, in, in terms of uh, mandating vaccines, that has not been as a, uh, functionally uh, relevant at this point in time. It's been more getting access for those who want it. Um, we do inform people that they, the information may be shared. Um, it is something that in the healthcare environment, particularly people who are involved in patient care, there are very flu uh, vaccination and um, the process to, to um, have, ensure that all of our patients are safe as they're being cared for in the hospital is something that's been an ongoing um, process where we're, we really do try and, and balance the need for uh, the safety of our patients with the privacy um, and, and the uh, individual needs of our caregivers. And so I think that's going to extend very much to, to COVID as, as it goes forward. Um, I do think also with testing, that has again been driven by uh, best care for patients as well as maximum protection for caregivers. And so making sure that um, if, if someone has a COVID positive test, that they're not um, coming into work, that they're aware of it as quickly as possible and the protocols in place there, um, while not sharing that broadly with all the rest of the care team, except where an exposure mandated that. Joshua, um, as a bioethicist, what what are the ethical issues that you see posed by mandatory requirements for vaccines? And as Elizabeth said, you know, there has been a limited supply of COVID vaccines. So what are the ethical issues there with respect to prioritization for distribution and, um, and uh, supply? Yeah, thanks. I, I think, you know, sort of playing off of my co-panelists here a little bit, um, privacy is certainly also an ethical issue in, in many ways around uh, mandatory vaccination. Something that hasn't been mentioned that I think is at least part of the, of the determination of, of the ethical appropriateness of, of mandating vaccines, at least COVID-19 vaccines, is, is their continued status as um, approved for emergency use under an emergency use authorization. So. Um, I, I would, if, if forced, and, and I'm, I'm taking myself to being gently forced here, if I had, to, if I had to, to say where I might raise some question around the ethics of requiring, it would be um, for, for a, uh, an intervention, in this case, a vaccine that had not yet been fully approved by the FDA. Um, there are certain, certainly issues there ethically about um, requiring a vaccine um, for for uh, healthcare workers. Now, on the flip side of that, you know, I, I think what's interesting here is is also what, <clears throat> excuse me, the organization's obligations are 
to their healthcare employees. So we'll, we'll get into to some PPE and, and some other issues around safety later, I know, but um, you know, I, I tend to think from an organizational ethics standpoint that, that um, businesses and, and healthcare systems have moral agency. And so they have certain responsibilities to their employees. One of them being ensuring um, relative safety of, of their work. And so there are a number of considerations that, you know, when, when you start shifting the discussion into thinking about distribution, you have to start thinking about what it is that we're trying to accomplish with that distribution. Um, when it comes to, to employees, part of it is providing adequate protection to their employees. Um, but as hard as it is, and, and I got to say, you know, reflecting over the things that, that I and my colleagues have been involved in for the last year, I have to continuously make this cognitive shift in my mind. The organization's primary responsibility under a situation of pandemic is to ensure that there are enough healthcare workers to take care of sick patients who are coming through their doors. So, you know, that could be something, the EUA argument still stands, but that in my mind, from an ethics perspective, could, could push further um, an organization to mandate uh, an, a vaccine simply to ensure that there's enough workforce to, to continue to provide excellent care to sick patients. Um, now that's been challenged, I think, um, as, as Elizabeth alluded to, by some of the ways in which Ohio in particular has moved through the different phases of vaccine and, and really, you know, shut the door down on, on that 1A phase of distribution um, at, at, and relatively abruptly and said, you know, you, you're going to be done. Uh, you're going to get as many as you can get into arms of healthcare workers by this date, uh, and we're going to move on to, to a next phase. So, there's a little bit of a sort of ethical dissonance in, in that uh, as well. Now, as, as things have accelerated um, in terms of availability and, and vaccination um, distribution, that's become less of a problem because now the, you know, increasingly the case, healthcare workers are eligible per the, the general um, phases of, of openness, uh, 10 more days and, and it'll be open to everyone over 16 or 18, depending on, on which vaccine you get. You know, now we have three uh, vaccines that have been approved for emergency use uh, by the FDA. Um, there's also, that's Pfizer, Moderna, and Johnson & Johnson. The AstraZeneca vaccine is, um, has not yet been approved, but um, we know that uh, that's under consideration. Have any of you dealt with issues with your respective institutions or your clients with respect to whether um, employees or patients should be able to choose which one of those they get. And now particularly thinking about AstraZeneca, there's been some pushback um, in the EU where it's in use about uh, whether it um, is leading to blood clots and um, other concerns. Um, who wants to start? Elizabeth, I'll pick. I, I'm, I'm happy to start. I think that we've um, been trying to make sure that there's a lot of public education. Um, and, and I think communications have really developed and accelerated uh, among the, the things that have, we've learned through the pandemic is the importance of, of being very clear and transparent about things that we know and things that we don't know, both internally and externally. There's a lot of public education. And I think my understanding from our infectious disease experts um, is that really of, of the three available authorized vaccines um, for the clinical trials, all of them uh, prevent hospitalizations and all of them prevent death. Um, and I think there is some difference between the numbers um, on overall um, prevention of any illness um, but all of them were measured differently, and so it's a little bit challenging to put side by sides together. And they were done, particularly with the Johnson and Johnson vaccine. Uh, the clinical trials were conducted at a later point in time when we were tracking more closely variants that seemed to be more virulent, both contagious and severity. And so I think that um, 
as a matter of recommendation, everything that I've always heard is to take the first available. Um, and really the time is of the essence as much as anything, particularly with the um, proliferation of variants. Um, and, and also again, transparently understanding that there may be need for additional boosters. Um, that it, as if there are continued changes to the vaccine, that there, there may need to be follow-up uh, shots in the future. And so um, I think we've been, uh, when we have the information and we're scheduling people, we do let them know um, what vaccine they're scheduled for, partly because there's a difference in the interval and whether there's one shot or two, since Johnson & Johnson is just one, uh, Pfizer, the second shot generally fi follows 21 days after and Moderna, 28 days after. And so there's a little bit of a difference that's a, um, accessible to people at the time that they schedule. And we do try and accommodate to the extent that supplies available, um, the ability to, to select. Josh, anything you want to add to that? Uh, you know, I would, the only thing I would add to that that, that may go um, a bit under the radar is, it, you know, I, I'm an ethicist in, in the clinical realm. I, I, I advocate for, for people's ability to choose among available options to them all the time. I also advocate for offering only available options that are clinically viable. And so there, there are some barriers um, to, you know, increasing overall access and the requirements of things like cold storage, for example, right? So it's simply not going to be the case that, you know, in a geographic and more remote or more and more rural that, that those choices simply may not be there for every patient. Um, and it may be simply a matter of practical um, expediency that if you schedule an appointment to get a vaccine, at our main campus, and I don't, I don't think this is actually the case right now, but um, you know, you, you may be more likely to get, say, Pfizer or Moderna because we can keep it ultra cold here and have it prepared, as opposed to you know a, a clinic out in even Ashtabula or you know further out into to Lake County or out in the Youngstown area where that's going to be increasingly difficult. I don't think healthcare organizations are required to make all three available to everyone in every setting, right? I, I think that's, that's probably a, a super erogatory requirement for, for healthcare organizations. Amory, have your clients uh, come to you asking whether they have any rights to one vaccine over an, another? Is it they haven't, but now that you've raised it, I'll be prepared to tell them that they don't have a choice. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I want to shift to the issue um, that thankfully seems not to be a problem now, but was early on in the pandemic and ask you about lessons learned from uh, limited supply of um, or inadequate supply of some key things such as beds, ventilators, oxygen, therapeutics for COVID. Elizabeth, let's start with you. Uh, sure, you know, it, we did a tremendous amount of preparation and I think there was really terrific collaboration across health systems, um, particularly uh, ethicists really um, speaking with each other uh, and trying to come up with really objective standards uh, for potential um, limits of supply while not taking into account life expectancy, disability, or anything else, but, but still trying to, to make sure that, that equipment was, was put to, to best possible um, use given patient needs. And, and I think that as we, um, the collaboration evolved, it ended up being a real effort to make sure that we um, were at an actual emergency rather than a localized one and um, really enabling uh, transfer of patients and um, identification of resources regionally um, so that we really were not in a position of um, making decisions in the absence of actual shortages. Um, and I, we were fortunate that we did not um, have any of those issues with respect to those kind of supplies that we uh, had seen in other uh, regions of the country. I do think the biggest issue that we did face was um, the, the issue of, of staffing, um, particularly as the surge really was reaching its peak and 
Um, I know that uh, some other institutions had extraordinary uh, pressure on, on staffing ratios uh, for beds. And again, that kind of uh, collaboration to transfer patients to make sure um, that the, the standards of care were maintained um, really did enable um, the, the community to be served well. Um, but it does un undermine the point that um, was made earlier about protecting staff uh, and, and the ethical responsibility to, to continue to be able to provide care. Anne-Marie, um, from your perspective with your employee clients, uh, what were some of the lessons learned from having to uh, work in conditions with potentially inadequate supply of PPE? I, I will say that I had a lot of really hard conversations with legitimately terrified employees. Um, and those ranged from, you know, a situation where I, I had a, a pregnant uh, healthcare worker who, you know, was in direct contact with, uh, with COVID hospitalized patients. Um, I had a, a client who had a loved one who had a uh, severe heart condition that she lived with and she was a caretaker for, um, but not an FMLA uh, within that the group of, of caretakers defined by the FMLA, um, who was also a healthcare worker. Um, I had other healthcare workers who I know at least one hospital system um, at some point during the surge said, even if you've had close contact with a uh, COVID positive person, unless you have a positive test, we still want you to come to work. Um, and, you know, there were a lot of employees who were very concerned about that, understanding that there were staffing pressures that were real and significant, but there were employees who were very concerned about that policy and whether they were working in a safe environment. So, you know, really, it was a highly particularized for each of these. And I've got, you know, probably a dozen other similar stories where the employee is placed in a really difficult position. And and these are legitimate concerns about safety and their well, their own well-being and the well-being of, of their loved ones. Um, and you know, there was a highly particularized inquiry for each one of them to see if there was some existing employment statute that might provide them some avenue uh, to make a request for accommodation. Um, and, you know, really because, you know, the, the law is not designed to respond um, to this exact situation. Uh, the, you know, the, the OSHA laws have a very, very high standard about when an employee can legitimately refuse uh, a work assignment. And it's something like, um, you know, they have to have a, a, a well-founded belief that they are in imminent danger of serious physical injury or death. And so I don't know that, you know, any of those scenarios that I've described rises to that high, high level. Um, but, you know, if, if the, the situations that were most difficult were the, the people who were, you know, caretakers for people who um, had, you know, real vulnerabilities, but they didn't really have any avenue towards protection. Um, and you know, in those circumstances, the conversations I were, was having is you really just have to go and with heart and hand to human resources and ask for an accommodation that you're not entitled to. So be very careful about how you approach this situation because even if you're denied, you probably won't have any protection under the law against retaliation and you have no right to this, uh, to this accommodation. So you really have to go about it in a way that's highly diplomatic and um, and, uh, and appropriate and really plead your case knowing that there's no, uh, that there's no legal right uh, to, to back up that request. So that, that was hard. And then, you know, of course, with the PPE uh, early on when, you know, the, the, the reusing the masks and, and the gowning and all of the challenges that we had, you know, back in late spring, early summer, uh, you know, that was, uh, again, you know, you, what is that standard about, uh, you know, refusing work? It was uh, just tremendously difficult to advise those clients because I've not been in a situation um, where the law was so ill-equipped to address really legitimate, not exaggerated, not 
um, you know, game playing, but really legitimate concerns about physical safety and welfare of employees. Do you think that the there will be some legal developments arising out of this situation? Well, I thought what the last speaker said about this being our uh, starter pandemic was both interesting and disheartening. Um, but I think that I, I, I think that you know. I think that institutions, especially healthcare institutions, are more apt to have policy responses um, that that better equip uh, us all for a similar situation in the future. Um, I would be surprised, given aggressive legislative agendas, uh, whether this sees the light of day at a federal or state level in terms of uh, a, a legislative solution to these problems. At this point, I want to encourage all of the participants in the conference attendees to submit any questions that you have. I'll be moderating the Q&A function, so please submit your questions. And Josh, I'm gonna to turn to you. Um, anything you wanna add with respect to the ethical impact of limited supply of PPE on either employees or uh, patients? Yeah, I mean, you know, a, couple, a, couple, God, a, lot, a lot of things come to mind this, in, in this space, but but I'll try to be brief. I, you know, following up on, on what Anne-Marie just mentioned about um, the sort of statutory response to some of these things, it, there, there was a lot of confluence between, you know, what, what was ethically supportable or even ethically preferable and, and what some of the boundaries were um, in, in a range of planning, not just around PPE, but, you know, things like, um, you know, limiting access to ventilators or, in fact, you know, moving, ven potentially moving ventilators from someone who was currently benefiting from it to someone who was believed to potentially benefit from it more, even if that meant that, that the first patient um, could, could potentially die. This, you know, these are things that um, states stay away from, states don't write laws about, um, you know, withdrawing ventilators for the sake of other patients, right? So uh, this was, and, and so much of, of the planning in, in many ways, I think everybody's touched on it in, in slightly different ways, but this level of uncertainty. So around PPE, you know, nobody really knew what safe enough was with PPE. And, and when, you've got providers who are accustomed to not being wasteful, but who um, simply, you know, have an abundance of supply. So, you know, your N95 gets steamed up because you've been breathing into it for a couple of hours, you go get a new one. I mean, this is what you do. So, so the idea that now you're, you're, you're going to reuse this same one for several days is, is really difficult. And, and I think it also goes back, if I could try to draw the connection back to something Elizabeth said about standard of care. Um, this was a big issue from an ethical perspective because you know, we think of standard of care usually as like the gold standard of care, right? And, and what was happening with this different planning is that we had to put ourselves in a mental space of different standards of care. So as you move through, you know, having one nurse for two patients in an ICU is our usual standard of care. In a situation where you simply have too few nurses or too many patients, one to five could be the new standard of care. So, so there's this idea that, you know, what, what does a standard of care mean? It's, it's fluid and not something that is fixed. And, and we can sort of say, well, this isn't a standard of care. It is. It's just one that operates under a different umbrella of justification when you when your orientation is the best outcome for this patient right here in front of you on the bed that's being cared for now the standard of care is appropriate to have those lower volumes when you shift that orientation to we need to prevent death of as many people as we possibly can um, and sometimes that means that the, the interests of this particular patient right in front of you are um, subverted to the interests of, of, of the greater salvaging of, of life, 
Um, one that's really hard for any healthcare provider to get their head around because that's not how they normally practice. And two, you know, that's where that orientation of, of um, standard of care gets shifted. Elizabeth, anything you want to add on that? Yeah, I would say specifically on PPE, I sort of going back to really um, the, the struggles of, of March and April and May, um, which have seemed a long time ago at this point. Um, I do think that um, learning about the disease, as um, we were just saying, like the idea of what is, how does it spread, understanding that um, in the abstract, and then wanting to provide as much protection for our caregivers as possible, and coming up against uh, the limitation is something that I know that um, UH has, has really been very forward thinking and making sure there's investment in domestic production. And one of the things that sort of following on this, the idea that there was contingency standards that were issued by the CDC and, and different levels based on supply and, and what was the appropriate follow-up um, was really getting developed in real time um, based on the needs of, of caregivers and infection control and infectious disease experts. It's sort of extraordinary to watch the, the policies in healthcare evolve really real time. Um, but it, it has been one of those things that you can see the way that gloves all of a sudden became part of the standard of care for drawing blood um, after AIDS, um, it, that masking may become something that becomes part of what happens in healthcare going forward. Um, and so it'll be interesting to see that, that piece as well. Joshua, we have a question that's come in from the audience for you, asking if you could speak to the adequacy of the informed consent process in the context of max mass vaccination sites. So we have this new site that um, has been stood up um, at the Wolstein Center downtown, um, vaccinating 6,000 people a day. Uh, can you talk about informed consent? Yeah, it, it's a really important question. So, so I appreciate someone asking it. Um, you know, informed consent in, in this particular um, arena is, is often um, an, an implied informed consent simply by agreeing to accept the vaccine. So, so there is an argument to be made that someone is providing their informed consent um, simply by showing up uh, to their appointment and, and allowing um, a healthcare worker to, to put the needle in their arm and give them the, the, the dose of vaccine. Now, the question of adequacy there um, you know, is a little bit more complicated in this case. Again, I think probably going back to the EUA status of these vaccines and, and what amount of information is adequate for someone to know. Um, I, I think where I would come down on this in brief is um, I think it's okay that it's largely an implied consent um, by someone showing up to, to receive their vaccine. On, on the other hand, I think it is, um, it is an obligation of those who are giving the vaccine to be prepared to answer questions that people might have before they actually let them um, give them the vaccine. So, you know, this could be difficult in the max vaccination setting where, you know, I have these images of um, you know, of, of sort of like stock photos of people in a line and someone with a, you know, the multi-dose vaccine gun uh, image, you know, sort of like signing up or en enlisting in the military and, and, and everybody going through line here. Um, there, there's not a lot of time for that sort of thing, but I, I think it would be appropriate for um, those who are giving the vaccine at those sites to be prepared to at least give an information sheet and, and be um, prepared to answer questions that, that uh, anyone receiving the vaccine might have. All right, we have a, another question here. Um, do you believe the statutory tort immunities for physicians and hospitals put in place during this pandemic strike the right balance between protecting healthcare providers and protecting patients? Should there be standing protection along the same lines for providers, hospitals, and physicians responding to emergencies? Elizabeth, do you wanna start on that? Yeah, I, I think they, they, um, they, they, they do strike that balance. I think that one of the things that um, being um, able to see um, the, the response is the amount of care 
that is um, directed at patients and service to the community that's part of every uh, conversation and strategic decision um, is, is very much there. I think that it's, it's um, innate in certainly my organization um, that, that what we're trying to do is provide the best possible care for every single patient. And I think that um, it, at some level um, that the immunity is secondary uh, to the response on the ground. Um, I think that people um, are having to make decisions and, and, you know, fortunately not the very difficult decisions that we discussed here, um, but in the light of an emergency, um, trying to respond uh, in the best possible way without um, taking into account liability that might um, interfere with having the best possible response. Um, I, I think that uh, the people who have um, are really working hard to, to respond are um, uh, doing so with all the right intentions and um, with all the right um, tools to, to really do so appropriately, uh, irrespective of, of the immunity. Anne Marie, what's your view? You think I have something to say about this, Kim? <laughs> Never ask a plaintiff's lawyer if tort reform is a good thing. Um, but, you know, I think that, you know, the, the concern that I have here is that you know, Elizabeth's comment about, you know, well-intentioned and conscientious healthcare providers applies to every circumstance. Um, and, you know, the concern that I have is that, you know, when you see legislation that's kind of rammed through like this to uh, address an immediate need that is, uh, that is legitimate and real, that, you know, there very could, there could easily be uh, overreach and creep and into areas where those laws and those uh, the, uh, the, the tort remedies are very much needed uh, to protect patients from medical negligence, which unfortunately, you know, happens despite people's skill qualification, best intention and, and best care. And so I would be very concerned about uh, a situation where that was used as a springboard to further limit plaintiff's rights. There has been um, a lot of controversy about um, immunity for nursing homes, for example. Anybody want to comment on that? Jim, I, I will. I'll sidestep that that particular question from a legal standpoint. And really, you know, this it, this isn't my space with the with the, the statutory tort immunities. Um, just a, a more general comment about, you know, all of different. Um, organizations working together here from state legislature on down, I think one of the challenges that, that we've seen, at least in Ohio, is that there's a disjunct between things happening at the state level and things happening at the local level. And we've tried very hard, I think, at least in the Cleveland area, to ensure consistency between the, the large hospital systems. Um, and I don't know that it's right or wrong, but you compare efforts in Ohio to, to say the efforts in Arizona where there was a much more you know, statewide coordinated effort to have a state set of crisis standard of care protocols that were enacted all at the same time and that all of the hospital systems in the state would abide by. Now there were some local practice differences, um, but you had, there, there was a more direct connection I think between what was being done from a, a, a legal standpoint from, from immunities, but also action by the governor and what the state was willing to stand behind because there was assurance that the plan that was in place that every physician would be acting under perhaps was easier than, maybe not easier, more straightforward providing immunity because it was a statewide plan, right? So, so there was a connection there. And Although right. to me that seems that uh, this is I'm really stepping far out of my area of expertise here, but it, it seems to me that to hold a, a doctor from a rural county in Ohio or a rural county in Arizona, which there are many, you know, very very rural counties where the hospital may have one or two, you know, ICU beds to the same standard as, for instance, the Cleveland Clinic seems like that would be kind of impractical. And, and difficult to administer. Yeah, I mean, you know, the, not to go too far down the pathway, but Arizona, you know, was committed that uh, nobody went to crisis or everybody went. So if that rural hospital 
you know, they couldn't, if they couldn't transport patients from that hospital to somewhere else that could accommodate them, um, the, the, the crisis standards would be enacted statewide and, and you know, govern action for, for all of the institutions under that, um, under that particular guideline, set of guidelines. Elizabeth, you wanted to say something? I would just, I would just emphasize the, the preparedness that was taking place was for, in fact, that crisis. That this wasn't, um, you know, when I, when I said the, the word well-intentioned, I think I was speaking to the extraordinary effort um, that people were putting in to really understand what the protocol ought to be. Uh, and when I talk about moving landscape, it's that that protocol is changing real time and we have people monitoring it 24 seven and communicating it out um, so that every single caregiver is understanding what the new understanding of the diseases as it's revolving in, in, in real time. And so I think, you know, to your point that I don't know that every institution um, necessarily has that ability to monitor so closely, to pivot, uh, to, to be on the cutting edge in the way that we had to be for the length of time that we had to be um, really maintaining that posture. So um, I do think that uh, the, 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 the statute tracked that, that really kind of extraordinary circumstance and extraordinary effort. All right, I'd like to move to uh, the question of what issues do you see arising next? So for example, um, remote work has been popular for many. Um, do you think there will be issues regarding whether employees can continue to work remotely? What other issues do you see? Um, let's start with you, Anne-Marie. So yes, this is what I think the, uh, this is, and I, I, I will say that I feel for employers in this regard, um, because I think that, uh, so for those of you who don't practice in employment law at all, uh, under the American with Disabilities Act, uh, an employer and the corresponding state, state law, an employer has an obligation to provide a reasonable accommodation to a, a disabled employee that will allow them to do the essential functions of their job. Um, and so the standard for what constitutes a disability is actually a very low standard. Um, I'm sure that almost everybody on this, uh, on this webinar um, could qualify as being substantially limited in one or more major life activities as that's defined uh, by the statute and the amendment to the statute. So what you have is, uh, is a situation where for years, and I mean probably the last 10 years, this subject of whether working from home is a reasonable accommodation has been heavily litigated. And you know, many employers have taken the position for a lot of different jobs that you know, work from home is not a reasonable accommodation because the person is unable to perform the essential functions of the job in that environment because of the need for collaboration, because of, a, of, a, of distractions, because of you know, customer uh, facing issues. Um, and so this has been a big fight and it's particularly an issue uh, that comes up as it relates to people who are requesting accommodations for mental health conditions. So, uh, you know, a person who says, you know, I have anxiety and my, my healthcare provider feels that I would, be, I would be able to manage this anxiety better from a home work environment and comes to work with this doctor's note. Um, and typically an employer has, with a very rare exception, an employer has been within its rights to say no. So now we face a situation where the same employee that, you know, a year or two years ago uh, would have been making this request for an accommodation. How does the employer look at this person and say, no, your job can't be done from home when that person has been doing their job from home for a year and that you can't perform the essential functions of your job from home. And that's, a, that's gonna be a, a very difficult, um, it's gonna be a very difficult line for the employer to draw. And I think that uh, employers in a lot of different settings, including the healthcare settings for non-clinical roles are really going to be seeing uh, when they call their workforce back to work, um, I think that there is going to be a, a just a, a, a deluge of accommodation requests for those people who are unlike me and really enjoy working from home. 
Elizabeth, you want to comment on that? Sure, I, I do think um, that there's going to be some legal issue um, that is really going to turn on the clinical understanding of transmissibility of vaccinated um, in people. So we talked about mandatory vaccinations, but I think one of the things that people will be concerned about coming back in the office is going to be the continued ability to, to bring the disease home uh, to their family, particularly if they have family members who aren't vaccinated. And I think there are some concerns under privacy laws and genetic information, um, Gina in particular, kind of about sharing the vaccination status of family members. So while you may be able to know about employees, understanding that about their family members um, is an issue and, and that continued concern and how that fits in um, with, with the kind of things that Anne-Marie was speaking of, I think is gonna be a, an area that will be subject to further development. Yeah, and if I could just dovetail off of what Elizabeth is saying, because I didn't elaborate on this point, but you, you raise a good point. So the EEOC has come out and said that you can inquire of your employee whether they are vaccinated. But if the answer to that is no, it's, it, the, it's very touchy to, find, to ask why not, because you could then be asking questions that, that in order to answer, the employee would be required to divulge protected health, health information. Um, so that's something that employers have to be very careful about. Josh, anything you want to add to that? Um, not so much about the work from home. I mean, I think that's going to be an interesting issue to see how it pans out. I guess just from a more over, overarching thought about where things are going to go. And I guess this is kind of tied in some ways to, to thinking about ongoing lessons learned. You know, um, we spend an inordinate amount of time planning for um, an extreme shortage of supplies and, and space. And I think what, what you know, Elizabeth mentioned earlier, one, it turned out we were, we were wrong in orienting our, our orientation toward that early on. Um, and in fact, the biggest issue became um, one of, of space and, and um, staff, right? In, in December and January. Um, so I think, you know, moving forward, I would anticipate that um, there's ongoing conversation about these, some of these dusty old crisis standards of care that have existed for many, many years, partly for that reason, you know, and I, and I don't fault anyone for that. I mean, the, the dusty old copies of these crisis standards of care are oriented toward mass casualty events and toward, um, you know, disasters where, where there's a, a, an acute need for um, caring. You know, when we think of triage, this is what you think of, right? There's a, there's a roof collapse in a, in a sports stadium or something, and everybody's in the parking lot, and you're trying to go through and mark them red, yellow, and green. And, you know, that wasn't COVID. That, that wasn't what, what we were facing. And so I think what folks will start to focus on more from a planning aspect is recognizing this kind of smolder of, of the contingency phase where you're having to make adjustments in, in the care that's being provided so that you can, can try to maintain those usual standards of care that's happening over a very long period of time. And, and that was something that um, I think probably can only be seen in hindsight, but hopefully is, is a lesson for, for how we move forward in these things. I know others are touching on this, but I would certainly be remiss to, to, to not point out that, um, you know, the, 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 the degree of spotlighting of um, inequities in outcomes and access that we've seen um, is a huge factor for how things move forward. Um, even in my own field, something that, you know, we, we certainly care a lot about. There's, there's been a lot of introspective as a, as a field sort of saying, you know, we really missed the, the mark here in, in the last 10 or 15 years and not paying greater attention to, um, to, to this particular problem. Uh, and, and I think there's um, been a little bit of, of culpability in our, in our own practice around, um, you know, how, how we help healthcare organizations uh, get better at reducing those inequities and, and increasing access. All right, final question in 30 seconds or less. 
I'm going to ask each of you, starting with Anne Marie, then Josh, then Elizabeth, what's your top lesson learned in this area from the uh, pandemic? Anne Marie. I guess mine would be one of humility because you know you do you practice in a certain area for long enough and you pretty think, think you can pretty much answer any question that comes your way and I would say over the last year you know there have been so many questions raised that I have really no idea the answer to and you know having to look across all of these different statutes the ADA the FMLA. Um, you know, OSHA laws, the newly enacted CARES legislation, the Family First Response Act, that, you know, it has really, it's been interesting and challenging um, to really view these uh, old and new laws through a different lens with a, 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 you know, not to use a trite and overused term, but through these unprecedented circumstances and trying to, you know, analyze these situations that arise in employment law against really no relevant precedent. Josh? Um, I mean, I think part of part of what I just mentioned is my, my biggest takeaway, my biggest lesson learned um, is just, you know, the, the need to really think about how to manage patient care in, in, in an ethically supportable way over the long haul. Um, that, that's something that I think, you know, certainly we, we missed the mark on, even if maybe we we couldn't have foreseen it uh, in in uh, looking looking ahead. Um, I, I guess the other thing, on a positive note, though, is um, I've been impressed across the board with um, what can be accomplished collaboratively. So both locally and nationally, you know, our our message boards and bioethics were exploding during this time. We were all trying to figure out what everybody else was doing and. You know, but the progress in our own thinking over over like a six week period was probably two years worth of scholarship that that it was amazing. It really was amazing. So um, that that was definitely a, a positive lesson learned for me. And Elizabeth. Yeah, no, I think dovetailing with 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 those Josh and Anne Marie said, I think the sustained marathon quality of the disaster um, and and the the surge, not just right anticipated from from COVID, but of regulation and and information, um, and really how to enable that getting the systems to get that to the people who needed it, so that that could happen in real time and be responsive to the community needs from a public health perspective, to our collaborators, so that we were able to to manage things and internally to frontline caregivers to enable direct patient care and, and really make sure that the community was, was well cared for. Well, this has been a terrific discussion. And I know if we were in person, you'd get a huge round of applause. So thank you, a virtual round of applause. And we will be starting with our keynote uh, speaker promptly at 1210. And uh, that's Greg Shapiro. So please stay tuned for fraud during the pandemic. Thank you so much. Thank you, Kim. Thanks, Josh. Thanks, Elizabeth. Yeah. yeah, thanks, everybody. It was great. Thank you.
Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Kim Vixenstein. I'm pleased to be the chair of this conference. Uh, before we get started with our keynote address, I want to announce the code for the last panel. For those of you who are just listening and, and not watching, it's ethics, the word ethics. Okay, well, I, it's my pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker, Greg Shapiro. He has served as Assistant United States Attorney in the District of Massachusetts since 2005. He is Chief of the Affirmative Civil Enforcement Unit, and his work primarily involves healthcare fraud, including kickbacks and Medicare and Medicaid price reporting violations. For part of last year, he was on detail as the special counsel to the spe special inspector general for pandemic recovery, focusing on his topic today, which is fraud during the pandemic. Before joining the US Attorney's Office, Mr. Shapiro worked in private practice and in the Consumer Protection Bureau of the Federal Trade Commission. He is a graduate of Harvard Law School and Stanford University. And I will say based on my brief interactions with him and preparing, preparing for this conference, he's not only extremely bright and knowledgeable, but also a heck of a nice guy. So welcome to you, Greg. And uh, please, um, we welcome questions. Uh, uh, Greg will be monitoring the questions. So please submit questions through the Q&A function. Thanks very much, Kim. Uh, uh, so uh, this format is always a little bit difficult since you can't see the expressions on people's faces or and you can't tell if they're listening to you or asleep or doing something else. But um, uh, please do ask questions at any time. I'll try to answer them. Uh, Kim, if, if there are questions along the way that I don't see, don't hesitate to, inter to interrupt me, please. And uh, uh, it's certainly more engaging for me if there are questions and I hope more engaging for you too if there are questions. And and feel free to ask questions about anything, not just about the things I'm gonna talk about, but um, especially for the students out there, if you're interested in someday working for the Department of Justice, if you have questions about uh, what it's like or, or how do you get a job or anything like that, I'm happy to go way off topic and just talk about my career at DOJ. As Kim said, uh, I've been doing this now for 16 years. I'm actually gonna leave this job very soon uh, um, and, Go off into the the real world, but um, uh, but it's been a great job. Uh, I've gotten to do wonderful things, trying to um, recoup money uh, for the taxpayer. Typically, uh, as a result as a result of fraud, I've done um, most of my work in the pharmaceutical industry, but I've done other healthcare cases and then non healthcare cases um, as well. So, oh, and also Kim, I think wanted me to mention that the code for this session is fraud. I'm sure she'll mention that again later, but for CLA purposes, it's fraud. Um, so again, uh, don't hesitate to ask questions. And if somehow I don't see them, somehow figure out how to get my attention because uh, I don't mind being interrupted. And I also don't think I have a full hour of material to talk about. Um, uh, so the questions will, will help us fill that hour. I'm gonna try to share my screen and, and show the PowerPoint that I put together. And I hope you can all see that. And then, yeah, okay. If you can't see that, somehow alert me. And I think because the PowerPoint is now on the screen, I can see even less and I can't really tell if there's a question. So um, if, maybe if there's some way to make, uh, present the questions orally, that would, that would help to get my attention. Um, so this is my topic. And actually, although um, Kim mentioned, I, I did do a detail last year for the special, special Inspector General for Pandemic Recovery. That did not involve healthcare fraud. Um, the jurisdiction of that new agency, SIGPER, is focused on certain financial assistance programs that um, mostly operated by the Treasury and uh, didn't include the PPP, which is the most famous one, the Paycheck Protection Program, but it did include uh, some of the support for the airline industry, and it did include a program called the Main Street Loan Program. Uh, but for most of my career, I have done healthcare fraud. Um, and uh, most of, but I should say that most of the fraud that involves um, uh, COVID-19 so far 
has not been on the civil side and, and my work has been on the civil side that is recovering money not trying to uh, put people in jail and charge them with crimes so those kinds of cases typically take longer and i expect that the civil cases arising out of the pandemic um, will happen over the next few years but there's been very little civil at least any very little completed civil enforcement action that we can discuss publicly to date involving the pandemic. Uh, so what I'm gonna talk about today, which I think is on the next slide, just the general list of things. Um, these are things that I have talked to people about and that I have um, uh, researched a bit, uh, but I have not actually done these cases. So typically when I'm asked to speak at conferences, I talk about things that I've done and it's very easy for me. I don't really have to do any work, but in this case, I actually did have to spend some time uh, talking to agents who've worked on these cases, to colleagues who've worked on these cases, and then I did a, uh, some research uh, looking at, at things that the Department of Justice has done uh, in these areas. And a lot of this work so far has been um, criminal. It's been just blatant frauds, the kinds of cases where um, we'll talk about some of the blatant frauds, but um, where it's relatively easier to put together a case quickly, uh, and, the, and there's a, a real um, interest in the government in stopping it quickly. Um, and while I think some of this will generate civil cases in the future, those, as I said, those cases haven't started yet. So these are the, the seven types, let's see, seven, yes, we've got seven different types of, of frauds that, um, and I think there are, there are certainly more, but these are seven types of fraud that we've seen arise uh, as a result of uh, the pandemic and, and as a result of steps that the government has taken to address the pandemic. And the first four topics, telemedicine fraud, diagnostic testing fraud, pharmacy fraud, and nursing home fraud, actually are the, the types of fraud I'm going to talk about are a di direct result of um, so-called COVID-19 waivers that um, CMS, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, has put in place to make it easier for people to get healthcare during the pandemic. But um, an unintended consequence of those waivers has been to make it easier to commit fraud as well. And I'm not here to make policy statements. Um, uh, CMS decides, uh, you know, what's it, they, they try to do what's in the best interest of the American public. And presumably they weigh the costs and benefits of the, of the steps they take. And it may well be that the benefits of making it easier, for example, to uh, get healthcare remotely, uh, far outweigh uh, the costs that that will uh, create in terms of fraud. Um, that's, not, uh, that's not my job. My job is just to see, okay, well, there is fraud. And if there is fraud, then let's see how we can uh, take steps to address it by either um, bringing criminal cases or bringing civil cases to recover the money and trying to stop it and trying to get the money back and trying to um, discourage others from committing the same types of frauds. Those are the basic jobs of the Department of Justice. And uh, it's for the Department of Health and Human Services of which CMS is a part to make the policy decisions on um, uh, what types of uh, healthcare the government is going to pay for. And then the, the last uh, three types of fraud aren't directly related to uh, steps that HHS has taken. Um, uh, but nonetheless um, are things that are directly related to uh, COVID-19 and that we did not see um, beforehand. And actually the, the fifth one of those, the Provider Relief Fund is something that came out of the CARES Act, which is the big, the, what was the biggest stimulus program before the latest one a few weeks ago, but was the big stimulus program in March of 2020 uh, that created the Paycheck Protection Program and lots of other programs and amongst those things was this provider relief fund that gave money to um, physicians who were enrolled in Medicare and who were not seeing a lot of um, patients, at least initially during the pandemic. And this was to help uh, them get by. So anyways, I'll go through the, each of these one by one and try to describe uh, what we've been seeing. And again, don't hesitate to ask me a question if you don't understand something or if I'm not being clear, or if you have a comment, I'm happy to try to debate uh, to the extent I can. And I'm also help, uh, happy to go off topic. So let's see. Okay, so um, one of the, the types of um, 
uh, scams that we have seen grow during the pandemic has been telemedicine scams. And these telemedicine scams were very common before the pandemic as well, but they, they're easier now uh, as a result of the relaxation uh, of the rules on uh, remote, the provision of remote healthcare. So uh, the, the classic telemedicine scam that existed before the pandemic and that still exists now is that there are these brokers out there who, are, who will obtain a list of Medicare beneficiaries. Um, how they, they may do that by breaking into someone's computer, they may, if you, if you go into the dark web, you can buy these things of so lists of Medicare beneficiaries, which will have their, their Medicare numbers, their so-called HIC numbers, it'll have their contact information for the Medicare beneficiaries, um, and it may have some additional information about those beneficiaries. And so those brokers who've got these lists will sell them to telemarketing companies and the telemarketing companies may not even be in the United States. Uh, and then what happens is these telemarketers uh, may be calling from India or the Philippines or wherever, or the United States, um, they start contacting Medicare beneficiaries and they start saying, gee, would you like, um, hello, Mr. Or Ms. Smith, uh, would you like, um, uh, uh, to be uh, to receive this diagnostic test, uh, for example, a genetic test that might tell if you're likely to uh, get a certain type of cancer in the future, or some other type of diagnostic test like that. Or it may be that they're in, they try to sell, uh, not sell, but they're trying to offer these Medicare beneficiaries uh, uh, what's called durable medical equipment, or DME, so a back brace or a scooter, um, uh, all any any sort of physical piece of equipment that's covered by Medicare. Um, and most people probably say, no, I don't really want that. But some people are like, oh yeah, sure, I'll take that. And especially, and the telemarketers are able to say that it's basically free um, and that there won't be a copay or um, maybe they're even lying and it's not free, but, uh, but the beneficiary thinks it's free. And so the, the beneficiary says, okay, yeah, I'll, I'll take that, um, that piece of DME or that, that, that test that's gonna tell me uh, if I'm gonna get cancer or if I can take this certain type of drug. And um, once they get a yes, they say, okay, um, you know, do you mind talking to a doctor for a few minutes? And in the meantime, the telemarketer has uh, arranged with, maybe it might be another company that hires doctors who um, get paid just to uh, basically sign off, uh, sign orders for the DME or the diagnostic testing that the telemarketer has gotten someone to agree to accept. Um, and, uh, so these doctors are being paid um, by the telemarketer or by a telemedicine company, and they basically have a, just a stack of um, sheets in front of them with very basic information about the patients. These are not the patient's regular doctor, so there's no little or no patient history that the doctor has to look at. Um, but there may have been the telemarketer may have written down some things during the interview or during the telephone call with the patient um, about them. And, the tele and so the doctor's got that in front of him or her. And uh, the doctor may or may not actually do a telemedicine or a telehealth appointment with the, or uh, a meeting with the patient. Um, and, uh, but if they do that, it's usually a very brief interaction over the phone or perhaps over video. And, um, and then the doctor writes up an order uh, for a prescription for the DME or the diagnostic testing. And that's like gold for the, for the, the operators of the scam because now they've got a physician's order and then they can submit that to, um, uh, to Medicare and um, under the auspices of this physician who was basically taking a kickback to write um, an order for a piece of equipment or a test that's medically unnecessary. Um, and generally that physician also will submit a bill to Medicare uh, for what's called an EM an e &M visit, an evaluation and management visit, which is e &M is whenever you go to a doctor for just a basic visit, you have the flu, you've got a broke, uh, not a broken arm so much, but some, some basic common visit to the doctor, um, that's an EM an e &M visit. And that's, uh, so the physician submits that claim to Medicare. Um, and then in the meantime, the, the telemarketing scam people have submitted the claim for the DME and they get lots of money for that, uh, they, which is enough money for them to pay the doctor, to pay the telemarketer uh, or to pay the broker and to make some money on the back end. And then what happens is the 
uh, equipment gets delivered to these people. Sometimes they don't even know it's coming. It just usually uh, sits in their house for a couple of days, uh, sits in their house totally unused or just gets thrown away. Maybe they um, maybe they do or do not get the actually get the, the test, but uh, the test gets billed for. Um, so uh, this scam was is, is unfortunately very um, popular. Uh, the scams are usually criminal and there's been, and if you look up telehealth or telemedicine scams or indictments, you'll find lots of DOJ press releases uh, in, indicting doctors and indicting these telemarketers uh, and, and these brokers. Um, the schemes vary a little bit, but, but what I described is the basic idea. Um, but one way to figure out um, whether this kind of scam was, was happening was to look at the Medicare claims data and see if there was a there was physical distance between the doctor and the patient. If the doctor and the patient were hundreds of miles away from each other, that was a giveaway that there was something wrong. Because uh, prior to COVID, Medicare and almost in very few generally did not reimburse for remote visits, which are um, can be called telehealth or telemedicine. I, I'm not an expert in this area, but I've heard that. Some people say that telemedicine is limited to instances where it's just over the phone uh, and doesn't, and the physician doesn't see the patient. And telehealth is where the physician is doing a video call, kind of like what we're doing right now. Um, but regardless, Medicare didn't re well. Medicare didn't reimburse for telemedicine at all. So Medi Medicare required in a few instances where Medicare would pay for a remote visit, there had to be a video hookup, and it had to comply with with um, HIPAA. And um, uh, and the patient generally had to go to a, a particular place, like a hospital or or some sort of medical clinic, and uh, they couldn't just be at home. And Medicare generally on, only reimbursed for these types of things where the patient was in a remote area where there wasn't adequate healthcare, uh, there weren't where there weren't enough physicians to see uh, to satisfy the demand for patients. So Medicare permitted. Uh, this type of telehealth service and reimbursed for it uh, in, on, in these limited circumstances where there were, um, where the, uh, the patient uh, was in a rural area and where the patient went to a facility to, to take the video call with the physician. Um, but Medicare generally did not reimburse for all of the other instances uh, where you might provide telehealth. That is to the vast majority of uh, Americans who do not reside in rural areas and where there is um, adequate uh, local uh, physician coverage. So if you saw, so if, if we, the DOJ or if um, the Office of Inspector General for the Department of Health and Human Services was, look, was looking at data and saw that there were a lot of claims coming in from a particular doctor and the doctor's patients were all over the country that was a dead giveaway that this was some sort of scam. Um, and let's see, are there questions there? So, what mechanism? So, I'll, I'll, I'll stop for a second. So, what mechanisms are in place, such as electronic systems, to ensure that one cannot bill for a service that isn't provided? Um, uh, I'm trying to think. Um, I mean, it's not obvious all the time. Uh, one suggestion that something might be awry is if you look at other um, associated claims and the, and the one claim seems inconsistent with the patient's medical history and you wonder why, why is this person getting this when they don't seem to have a condition that would merit that. Um, but a lot of times what we do when we are looking at data is we look at outliers in the system. So if a particular doctor is billing a lot and maybe more than uh, uh, it looks like they basically are billing enough to take to account for more than 24 hours a day of work. Uh, we'll focus on that doctor and maybe we'll go interview the patients and figure out, did you actually see the doctor that day? And if you did see the patient, how long were you there? And if the doctor was billing for what was effectively a half hour visit, but you were in and out in two minutes uh, or you didn't go at all, um, that's how we build those kinds of cases. And frequently, uh, we'll get tips that that kind of thing is happening too, but but the data can be very helpful um, in in identifying outliers. Uh, there's no, I don't think the data can necessarily say definitively that a service wasn't provided, 
uh, because uh, the data doesn't have a video camera uh, in the doctor's office showing whether the, the patient was there or not. And in these DME scans where the, the equipment is supposed to be delivered to the patient, the data do, does not include like the FedEx um, shipment information. All it sh shows is um, that the DME was, was ordered and supposedly delivered, but, it, but we haven't gotten to the point where there's um, uh, the data is so advanced that it would include things like actual shipping information or, or, or and the, the data also doesn't include like order data from the supplier. Um, maybe someday, 10, 15 years from now, it will be that, that comprehensive, but it's not, it, it isn't quite there yet. Um, and then the next question is, how did the extraordinary circumstances of this pandemic inform your prosecutorial discretion uh, more specifically, the rapid rollout of waivers and legislative fl flexibilities will naturally contribute to bad faith actions and good faith errors alike. How do you as a U.S. attorney prioritize and take mitigating factors into account? Um, I don't know that, I'm trying to think. I mean, if we saw a fraud, we're gonna go after it. I mean, the fact that, uh, and, and that the waivers may have ena enabled the fraud is not going to cause us to um, to look the other way. Um, I think my point here is that these waivers do enable a certain amount of fraud and, uh, you know, hopefully HHS has considered that and thought that the benefits outweigh the costs uh, and also may take steps in the future to try to, um, uh, to plug the, the holes in the system and maybe to do more monitoring whether there, where there is um, a potential for fraud. Um, uh, in terms of good faith errors, certainly, I mean, that's something that we look at in every case. So if we think that the, that the, the, the target of the investigation acted in good faith, we, and the, you know, that's frequently defense counsel's main argument. Um, and that's, that's a defense, both to a criminal and a civil case, then uh, we go, we go on to someone who we think acted in bad faith. So, and, and that's, that's frankly, what makes this job most interesting is um, the, we spend a lot of time thinking about C-enter issues, whether someone had intent to violate the law or intent to do something wrong. And, so, and uh, since people generally don't write down that they wanted to violate the law, you really get into these mental circumstances and, um, and it, makes, it makes the job interesting to me. It's more interesting than like, a, it's not to say it's not important, but cases like bank robberies and, and things like that, there's just really no issue about whether there was intent. Um, and these cases, uh, healthcare cases, frequently involve complex issues of uh, intent and in analyzing Cienter. And that's why I've been doing this for 16 years. Um, so, anyways, getting back to telehealth uh, scam. So, so in the so in the old system, um, you know, pre-COVID, if you saw a doctor who was treating patients all around the country, you'd say, "Aha, um, there's almost certainly some scam going on," because uh, the patients are not all in rural areas, so there's no exception that permits telehealth. Medicare doesn't pay for this, and the, and the doctor's still billing for it, so the doctor must be up to, to no good. And if the doctor's up to no good, why are they doing this? Well, maybe because they're getting kickbacks from one of these telemarketing companies that's doing a DME scam. And uh, let's look a lot more closely at that. Let's start calling the uh, beneficiaries to see, did you actually get the DME? Did you actually ask for it? Or does someone call? call you up and offer it? Do you really need it? Um, and, um, and go from there in terms of building a case. But now um, what's happening is Medicare has said for good reasons that you know it's, it's a lot harder for people to get even in, in urban areas to get to the doctor. They may not want to expose themselves to, poten to potentially getting COVID in a doctor's office. Um, and it makes a lot more sense uh, to do many common uh, e &M visits uh, over a video uh, call uh, where the doctor can render essentially the same care and uh, not expose either the doctor or the doctor staff or the patient to potentially getting COVID. And so HHS, I think for good reason said, okay, we're gonna allow doctors to do these, vi these uh, remote visits, um, that's legal. Uh, and so now if you see a doctor who's seeing patients all around the country, well, maybe that doctor is just a good doctor and, Patients from all over the country want to see him, and there's nothing inherently wrong with that doctor's claim. So, um, so you've got less leverage at the beginning to, to identify a scam in that case, and and the doctor has a 
at least the defense that didn't exist before that yes you know i know i'm uh, i yeah, i know i'm seeing patients all over the country but uh, i'm allowed to do that or it may not be all over the country but it may be you know all over new england or something uh, i'm in new england or all over ohio or something like that a uh, doctor and in Cleveland seeing patients in Cincinnati or something like that, which would not have been permitted before, uh, or you or you know, would have raised an eyebrow before because you wondered was someone driving from Cincinnati to, to, to Cleveland to get um, to get a visit, but now it's just fine. So, but these scams just continue. We've indicted a few in our office in the in the past year or so, and and I read about them all the time. And this is a really just a pernicious uh, type of scam that continues to afflict Medicare and I think in, in afflicts it. Uh, more during the pandemic. Um, the next few kinds of scams are actually things that did not exist uh, uh, pre-COVID, um, or at least didn't exist in exactly this form. But um, but but because of COVID waivers, uh, the CMS has basically enabled these types of scams. So one is um, diagnostic diagnostic testing fraud um, involving uh, pulmonary tests or respiratory tests. So um, I, I think probably everyone has, or most people have experienced, who've gone to get um, a COVID test were able to do so uh, without a doctor's order, at least in Massachusetts. Um, uh, I took my daughter for one the other day. She made an appointment online uh, through the public testing facility like an hour before we drove over there. She got the test um, and got the results 12 hours later and there was no doctor involved. Um, usually though, you need a doctor, you know, pre-COVID, you would need a doctor's order to get uh, that kind of test. Um, but what CMS did is not only did they say you don't need a doctor's order to get uh, a COVID test, but you don't need, a, at least initially, you didn't need a doctor's order to get other uh, respiratory tests as well. And the lab industry, which uh, has been fraught with fraud for decades now, um, quickly realized that, uh, you know, at least the, the bad elements in the lab industry realized quickly, well, here's a place where we can um, uh, commit some fraud and make some more money uh, beyond just the COVID tests, which are not particularly lucrative all by themselves. Um, but since a doctor doesn't need to order uh, these other respiratory tests that we can also do, uh, the labs would say, okay, well, if we're going to do a COVID test, we're also going to do a um, what's called a respiratory pathogen panel, an RPP uh, test at the same time. And we're going to bill for that. And that's actually a pretty lucrative panel of, of tests that the lab can um, bill to Medicare. So this scam worked particularly well uh, during uh, at the beginning of COVID when it was hard to get a COVID test. As I said, like I think I think it's pretty easy now. My I was a, my daughter was able to get one very quickly the other day, and I think in most parts of the country it's pretty easy to get a COVID test if you want one. Uh, but it was not easy last spring uh, and early summer to get a COVID test, and uh, and in nursing homes it was not was no easier there to get a COVID test. And nursing homes really needed the COVID test because, as we all know. Um, COVID ran rampant in a number of nursing homes, unfortunately. So these nursing homes were desperate for COVID tests, and the labs would approach them and say, "Oh, we'll give you the COVID test, and we'll, you know, we'll test as many patients as you want in your facility for COVID, but only if we can also do this RPP, this respiratory pathogen panel, at the same time, and we can bundle them together." And the nursing home didn't really care. There was no sweat off their back. They weren't paying for it. They said, "Fine." Um, in the meantime, the lab which doesn't need a doctor's order for this RPP test or the COVID test, um, comes to the nursing facility, gets, or, or at least gets samples from the facility, does these tests, and then bills Medicare, not only for the COVID test, which is all the nursing home really wanted, but also for this RPP test on, on every uh, patient in the facility, and makes tons of money billing for this extra test or extra set of tests that um, were not medically necessary and that nobody really wanted. And I've just listed down here, um, uh, one indictment that involved um, a scam kind of like that uh, out of the District of New Jersey. And I've, these are hyperlinks, although I don't know that that really, if, if someone wants these slides, I'm happy to send them later. And you can just, you can email me. I'll be at DOJ for another couple of weeks. Um, my email address is uh, Greg, G-R-E-G-G dot Shapiro, S-H-A-P-I-R-O at usdoj.gov. Feel free to email me and I'll send you the slides. Um, and then the hyperlinks will work for you if you're curious about looking at some of the press releases or indictment papers for some of these things I'm gonna talk about. Um, so my job mostly focuses on, on Medicare be, uh, and Medicaid be, 
because in other government healthcare programs like TRICARE, which is for the Department of Defense or the VA for veterans, um, uh, because my job involves recovering money for the government. Uh, but there's lots of other fraud out there that involves people who have private insurance or that pay for their health care out of pocket. And there's uh, there have been various other diagnostic testing fraud cases uh, or types of fraud that have affected people who are not covered by government health care programs. So, um, and I, I've actually personally uh, observed this one and I've heard quite a bit about it as well. The, the top one there is there's all these urgent care centers now um, who, and many of them offered to perform, perform COVID tests, but they said, if we're gonna do a COVID test for you, you have to do a regular uh, office visit with us, an E&M visit, um, which from the patient's perspective was like, I don't really need an E&M visit, e visit. I don't need an office visit. I know what I'm here for. I just want a COVID test. I wanna go in and out and get a COVID test, uh, but I can't find a COVID test anywhere. This urgent care center is the only place to get it. So you know, fine, you can do your E&M visit. Um, just don't charge me for it. Um, and uh, so the patient would say, fine, would go in there and the urgent care center then would bill the patient's insurance company for um, a visit that was completely unnecessary when, because the patient only wanted a COVID test. And uh, as I said, I observed this actually over, over the Christmas holiday, personally, when my family wanted to visit in-laws uh, or my in-laws and, uh, and wanted to get COVID tests in advance. And the only, and the only one available at the time was at a, an urgent care center. And they wanted to do this completely unnecessary e and visit. And I, thought, gee, this is a scam. But, but, and uh, I've heard quite a bit about it happening uh, elsewhere uh, where these urgent, unscrupulous urgent care centers are demanding uh, that the, the, basically the ability to bill for unnecessary uh, visits uh, in exchange for providing these COVID tests. Um, and that didn't, I don't think Medicare typically paid for that kind of thing, um, but uh, lots of private payers uh, did pay for that. And then uh, the last one, the last bullet on this slide involves um, uh, stuff that generally wasn't even covered by insurance. These rapid tests, which were um, very unproven and, and you know, they may or may not work, but there's a lot of debate about how accurate some of them are. And, um, and but a lot of urgent care centers were, were um, providing these rapid tests for 90 or hundred bucks. And again, same kind of thing, maybe someone wants to go visit a relative and they need a rapid test um, uh, and they pay out of pocket for these tests that were of questionable validity. Um, unfortunately, I don't think, you know, it, these, are, these are the kinds of cases that are, are hard to prove for us. Um, on the, well, first of all, these would be only criminal cases, not civil cases. They'd be criminal fraud cases uh, because the civil cases we bring are only when the government has been defrauded. Um, but for example, uh, to prove that one of that an urgent care center was offering a useless rapid test would be difficult, and their urgent care center would, would their defense would be, well, uh, it you know it we understand that it was somewhat accurate and it provided some value, and and we didn't promise that it was a perfect test, and uh, and uh, we charged a reasonable amount of money for it. So, and people were willing to pay for it. That was just a, a decision they made. Uh, with their eyes open. So making a fraud case out of that is not easy. Uh, nonetheless, there were a lot of relatively uns unscrupulous urgent care centers that were charging a lot of money for tests of very questionable um, utility. Um, so here's uh, another one um, involving pharmacies um, that um, again was enabled by a COVID waiver that uh, CMS put out. Um, CMS said um, that you could um, disp um, uh, dispense certain certain expensive drugs without a prior authorization. Um, and a prior authorization, uh, for those who don't know already, is a uh, a process where uh, insurers, including Medicare uh, Part D plans, will not pay for uh, a particular drug uh, unless they've got not just a prescription, but an explanation from the physician about why that drug is necessary. Uh, it may be that the explanation involves saying the patient tried this cheaper drug and it didn't work and uh, they need this more expensive one or that the patient has a unique condition and only this particular drug will um, suffice to treat that condition. Um, and, uh, and so 
many insurers and, and Medicare in that instance will require um, the doctor's justification in, in what's called a prior authorization form uh, before allowing, um, before paying for the drug, um, paying a claim from a pharmacy for the drug. Another thing that uh, CMS did to make it easier for people to get, um, well, so, but during the pandemic, CMS uh, relaxed their requirements for um, prior authorizations for certain drugs and allowed pharmacies to use these so-called emergency override codes to uh, dispense and get reimbursed for expensive drugs without a prior authorization. And this other thing that CMS did to make it easier for people to get drugs during the pandemic when it's harder to go to the pharmacy, harder to go to the doctor, um, is uh, they said that you can, instead of uh, pharmacies, instead of just dispensing 30 days, you can dispense 90 days. And this is right in the CARES Act, that, that uh, statute that was passed uh, a year ago, March. Um, uh, and so what some unscrupulous pharmacies have done, and, and there's been at least one indictment on this, is um, they were, this pharmacy was dispensing multiple 30-day uh, uh, supplies at a time, so 90 days at a time, and uh, using their emergency override code uh, to get reimbursement without a prior authorization. And then to top it all off, this particular pharmacy uh, in, in this indictment wasn't even buying the drug. So, the whole thing was fake, um, but they were able to get the claims paid by CMS because CMS had said, yeah, we'll, we'll allow uh, Medicare Part D plans to uh, dispense these drugs without a prior authorization because we know it's harder for people to get to the doctor now, and we'll allow um, pharmacies to dispense a 90-day supply, which is obviously more lucrative to a pharmacy than a 30-day supply, especially if the pharmacy isn't even supplying anything. Um, so that's a type of uh, fraud that was enabled by um, the COVID waiver. And this last type of COVID waiver fraud that I talk about is nursing home, is a type of uh, a couple types of nursing home fraud. So um, typically uh, prior to COVID, um, Medicare would will pay for a 100 day stay for a patient in what's called a skilled nursing facility. Nursing, uh, you may think of nursing homes as all the same, but there's actually different levels of care in nursing home. Uh, typical nursing home care may be covered by Medicaid, and that may be indefinite as long as the patient needs it, but Medicare typically only pays for 100 days in a higher level of care called skilled nursing facility care. And, um, and in order to get a second 100 day stay in the old system, there had to be uh, a 60 day break in care. And also, um, even before the first 100 day stay, the patient had to have been in the hospital for at least three days. So the idea of the Medicare stay in a, in a SNF, a skilled nursing facility, is that the patient was um, needed to recuperate. This isn't just long-term care. This is rehabilitative care where hopefully the patient's going to get out and resume their life uh, you know, as, as it was before they went into the hospital. So there was this three-day hospital stay requirement before you could go into a, a Medicare nursing home. And if you needed a second stay, there had to be a 60-day break. Well, um, in the, in the time of COVID, uh, HHS suspended both of those requirements. Um, uh, there may be some exceptions, but they did suspend them. And so now an unscrupulous nursing home can take a patient into a Medicare uh, skilled nursing facility, which is pretty expensive without the patient having been um, in the hospital. And moreover, uh, there's no 60 day break requirement. So there's no longer really and effectively a 100 day limit. What happens instead is you can renew the 100 days automatically and make it 200 days. Um, so some unscrupulous nursing homes are taking in patients who do not need the advanced level of care that a skilled nursing facility provides, the intense level of care, um, and then keeping them in for as much as 200 days instead of 100 days. Um, and uh, that's a way for a nursing home. And a lot of nursing homes aren't doing very well these days because of all the terrible stuff that's happened in nursing homes in the last year. And so this is a way for them to generate revenue and to get patients that they otherwise uh, pre-COVID would not have been able um, to get. I'm not aware of any um, actual cases involving this yet, but, I, but I, I would suspect that there will be cases involving this type of fraud. Let's see, another question. Are you seeing much activity out of the Ketam whistleblower and COVID FCA related uh, cases? No, I, I have not actually seen um, 
much. There's been a fair amount of uh, key TAM cases involving the Paycheck Protection Program, which is, doesn't involve COVID directly. It doesn't involve healthcare. Um, but I have not seen uh, much in terms of whistleblower cases uh, involving any of the types of scams I've talked about so far. And, um, and I could see some of these nursing home cases in particular, this type of nursing home fraud generating some uh, key TAM cases, but I haven't seen it yet. So we'll see. A lot of times, a lot of these out and out scams don't really make sense uh, for a key TAM case where someone wants to make money as a whistleblower because the defendants don't have any money. And most key TAM lawyers, uh, one thing they do in evaluating whether they're going to take a case is not only is did a fraud occur here, but is there a deep pocket defendant who can uh, pay because the lawyers are taking these cases on a contingency basis and uh, they, they don't want to, you know, if, if there's a fraud, but no money at the end of the rainbow, that's something that the government can do. Um, but private uh, whistleblower attorneys cannot afford to do that kind of work unless they're really beneficent. Um, Okay, so here's another um, uh, type of fraud that uh, this isn't caused by a COVID waiver per se, but it but it was sort of caused by the, the CARES Act. So um, initially, uh, last spring, when when people really didn't know what was going on and were very scared, uh, people were not going to the doctor. Uh, they weren't even doing these remote telehealth visits, um, and and many doctors' offices were. Um, uh, you know, very quiet and uh, the, the business was way down. And, and the same was true in hospitals. Although hospitals were very busy in their intensive care units uh, treating sick COVID patients, the rest of the hospitals were empty. They weren't, they were not doing elective procedures. They weren't doing pacemaker implants. They weren't doing knee replacements, none of that. People were just were deferring all of that as long as they could. So both hospitals and other uh, healthcare providers, doctors uh, and, and private practice, they, they all were doing very poorly and losing a lot of money or you know, not making the revenue they had the year before uh, last spring. So uh, one way to address that was in the CARES Act where Congress allocated $175 billion uh, to what was called the Provider Relief Fund. And uh, how that all of that money was uh, spent is a little complicated, but the first 30 billion uh, was dispensed in a fairly simple fashion. Basically, Medicare looked at every single Medicare provider uh, who was active in 2019 and looked at their share of overall Medicare reimbursement and said, and then took that person's share. So, you know, any particular doctor's share is going to be some small fraction of a percent, but whatever that share was, multiplied that by 30 billion and just sent a check to that doctor or to that hospital. And so, out of the blue, all these people got this money. Um, which they many of them probably needed because their business was way down last spring. Um, but uh, if if that particular provider had been committing fraud in 2019, which was the basis for the how much money they were going to get out of this CARES Act money, this provider relief fund money, well, then whatever they got out of the provider relief fund was derived from fraud as well. So uh, basically, the provider relief fund uh, enabled. Uh, uh, fraudulent providers to make money not only in 2019 when they were committing the fraud, but again in 2020 when they get this uh, extra money. And uh, I'm aware of at least one indictment so far involving this type of conduct where um, the provider had gotten got money out of the provider relief fund based on, I think, I forgot it was a man or woman, but uh, based on their 2019 claims uh, and in fact, wasn't even operating in 2020 at the time of the CARES Act, and so uh, didn't need the money to continue um, uh, treating patients. So it was totally wasted money. And again, this program made sense overall, probably, but uh, enabled a certain type of fraud. And I expect that there will be um, uh, more cases uh, like this, as you know, it, it's kind of an easy tack on charge, frankly, if you've uh, if we are investigating a provider for committing fraud in 2019, um, and we can prove that, well, then almost certainly they got money that they should not have gotten uh, in 2020 as well. So there'll be an additional um, fraud there. Okay, so I guess I think I'm supposed to go until 1.10 or so, correct me if I'm wrong. So I have a few more minutes. Um, again, I'm happy to take questions, but here's just some uh, uh, some other types of scams that really don't, uh, that don't involve uh, Medicare per se don't involve uh, decisions that um, 
HHS made uh, in terms of making it easier for people to get healthcare during the pandemic. Um, but these are things that we've probably all read about in the newspaper. So for example, selling uh, um, personal protective equipment that didn't exist. Um, it was very hard for, a lot. I think we all remember reading about how hospitals and, and doctor's offices and anyone who's involved in healthcare could not get, uh, couldn't get N95 masks, couldn't get uh, the proper gowns, couldn't get um, the, the face shields, all this stuff that was very scarce early in the pandemic. And that was an opening to lots of scam artists to say, oh yes, we have that. Um, but many people actually didn't have it. They just claimed that they had it and they and they offered for sale and took the money and, and then ran um, and never provided uh, the equipment that they had just been paid for. Um, there were also um, a number of instances of people selling equipment and actually delivering it, but it wasn't whether they had, it wasn't the equipment that they had claimed um, they had. So obviously N95 mask was the standard at the time. People were desperate for them. Um, and uh, there was one indictment charging a Chinese company with uh, selling masks that it claimed to be N95, but, but they weren't N95 masks. And um, I expect that there'll be more, I think there have been more cases involving that type of conduct. Um, and then there was a lot of uh, uh, activity involving uh, hoarding and, and price gouging. So typically in, in this country, it's a free market. If someone's willing to pay for what you're selling and you're not lying about what you're selling, you can charge any price you want. Uh, but that rule did not apply during the uh, has not applied during the pandemic because of something called the Defense Production Art, Production Act, um, which bans hoarding and, and price gouging uh, when the president has uh, declared a public health emergency, as President Trump did, and has deemed a particular type of um, uh, equipment scarce. So price gouging is basically charging more than uh, the price was before the the public health emergency. And uh, there, there's been at least one indictment that, that charged um, some people with um, uh, price gouging and hoarding and violating the Defense Production Act when they were uh, selling, trying to sell uh, personal protective equipment to the Veterans Administration um, at very high prices. And the VA, like all healthcare providers, was desperate to get this stuff. Um, one more question, let's see. Have you seen incidents with PPP fraud where a company would quote one price, but then the price would suddenly go up at the expected time of delivery? So again, I personally have not seen any of this stuff because um, this isn't really what I do, but, um, uh, and I don't know about that, but I think that if that type of conduct occurred, um, it would fit within uh, the definition of what's um, banned by the Defense Production Act and the statutes there, 50 USC 4512, which basically says, that the normal rules of, of um, uh, free capitalist enterprise don't apply during a public health emergency. And so if you start charging a lot more than the price was before, uh, that would be illegal, even if it would not have been illegal um, prior to the pandemic. Um, other things people have been desperate for, especially early on, they were desperate for any sort of COVID treatment, whether it was hydroxychloroquine, which was one that was big in the news, and then there were even even crazier ideas, um, but one doctor, I think he's in the San Diego area, was uh, indicted for selling these so-called, uh, what he advertised as COVID treatment kits. Um, and he, he promoted them as a, to at least some people as a miracle cure. And basically all they were were hydroxychloroquine pills and uh, they were not a miracle cure. Um, so that was um, just a, a basic fraud. Um, even crazier was a case that we had in Massachusetts where uh, someone was claiming that they had they they were selling this this lanyard that actually had some pesticide on it, and they claimed it would uh, protect people from viruses and including COVID nineteen. So these are just like common frauds. This type of stuff happened pre COVID too, with with dietary supplements and all sorts of things where people claim that that unproven things can cure cancer or cure diabetes um, and. COVID-19 was just another thing for scam artists to claim that their product could cure. Um, vaccine scams, uh, I, I have not heard of people selling fake vaccines in this country. Um, it may be happening, but as we all know, the country is actually doing okay on delivery of vaccines. I mean, I'm sure a lot of us would, per, would wish that we'd gotten a vaccine earlier or that, or that we could get a vaccine earlier, but but the vaccines are out there and, and a lot of people are getting them. 
Um, but in other countries, there's much less availability of vaccines. And Interpol recently, Interpol is a inter international organization of police organizations. They recently talked about uh, issued a warning, and then they noted that uh, there had been a seizure in South Africa of fake vaccines, and they noted that China had arrested uh, uh, some people for manufacturing and selling um, fake vaccines. Um, and I expect we'll. Um, hear more about stuff like that. But I suspect that also that that is more likely to happen abroad than in the United States, where I, I just, I can't imagine that many people would take a vaccine um, from someone where it isn't part of the controlled healthcare distribution system in this country. Um, but maybe it's happening. We'll see. Um, okay, I guess that was the end of my slides. Um, so uh, I'm, uh, um happy to take any other questions about life in doj um is there one more question down there i don't know maybe not um or thoughts about healthcare fraud or if not um i did talk for about 50 minutes which is longer than i expected and i'm happy to stop whatever you guys want um, right. maybe you could um comment on how the pandemic has affected your office and the department of justice in prosecuting fraud with freezes on trials and um, having to do a lot by um, Zoom or, or virtual technology and so on. Has that slowed down prosecutions? How has it impacted prosecution of fraud? Generally? It has definitely slowed down uh, our work considerably, um, as I think it slowed down many people's work. But, but some unique factors that ways in which it's slowed down our work. So on the criminal side, in order to indict someone to charge them with a crime, typically you need to go before a grand jury. Well, for a long time, grand juries, which are groups of, uh, it's usually, I think it's 23 people and at least 16 people have to be there to have a quorum. Uh, and they usually sit in a, a room that's kind of like a, a, a elementary school classroom and there'll be the prosecutor up front and a witness there. Um, and that just wasn't happening for, I don't know, at least probably the first six months of the pandemic. And even since then, it's been happening on a very small scale. And so it's been much harder to charge people with crimes. Um, and also, and, and the grand jury is also used as part of the investigative process as well. And you bring in witnesses to, and you just couldn't do that. So that, that had a huge effect on criminal prosecutions. Um, my work, is, as I said, is on the civil side and we don't use the grand jury unless we're also working with the criminal prosecutor, but we do, investigate and we build cases and, and the typical way we would build cases is not only we would review documents which that can happen now but we would also meet with witnesses in person um, and show them documents and um, and that would that's a big part of my job and for a long time we thought oh my god we can't do that and then we got a little more comfortable with zoom or you know these other pl video platforms and we started interviewing witnesses and and I have found that those interviews work okay, um, or we take testimony remotely as well now, but th those uh, interviews work okay, or those depositions work okay if it's a friendly witness, and they're basically gonna say what they're gonna say, but if it's not a friendly witness and you really wanna cross-examine them, or you really wanna show them documents and point to particular things, that is very cumbersome um, over Zoom and, or, or some other platform like WebEx. And it's also much harder to read what the witnesses' uh, facial expressions are, that there's sometimes a delay and sometimes you can't hear them. It's, it's just the technology is not, it doesn't replace live um, interactions, especially with hostile witnesses. So, and then just these are things that affect all lawyers or all people working remotely, but maybe DOJ more because because our computers have all the security on them. They don't work that well remotely, even just for normal work at home. So. Um, everything is just slower. And I would say we are probably at like 50 to 75% of our productivity um, that we were pre-pandemic, even now. I mean, it's like for a while, I'd say we were at 25%. Uh, it's gotten better as we've gotten better at using these remote tools, but it is not as good as um, as doing things in person. And, um, and that's, you know, it's made the job much more difficult. Have there been more settlements on the civil side because of the freezes on jury trials and so on? 
I think that would affect people more in the private sector where a private plaintiff might think, oh, I'm not going to get to trial two years from now. Um, uh, so I should just take a little money now if that's what's on, on the table. The government doesn't really operate that way. I mean, we can afford, as long as we can get, get a, uh, an extension of the status. The statute of limitations, we, it's not our uh, jury trials, I don't think it's affected, um, has caused us to be desperate to take, to take settlements that we otherwise wouldn't have taken. I think we're just as demanding as before, but it just takes us longer to get into a position where we can make a credible demand. That, that's been the difficult part. Um, there's a question here from Professor Laser. Uh, okay. For students, can you talk about what it's like to work in the Department of Justice and what types of jobs are available after leaving significant public service positions? Uh, okay. Well, what it's like, I mean, it really, so that's a very broad question. The DOJ is a huge organization. I don't know how many lawyers there are, but there's thousands. Um, and basically the way DOJ works is there are, there's, uh, main, there's the main divisions in Washington, and then there are uh, is the remote offices all around the country, U.S. attorney's offices. Each U.S. attorney's office is um, headed by a presidentially appointed U.S. attorney. And then there are, in Massachusetts, for example, I think there's about 125 assistant U.S. attorneys who are career civil servants. Um, and the job, uh, it varies dramatically depending on where you are in the country and where you are in the office. In my office, I'm on the civil side doing uh, these types of healthcare fraud cases, mostly against pharmaceutical companies and other big players and hospitals, uh, distributors of pharmaceuticals. Um, we also have on the civil side a unit that just defends the government, um, and that can be cases from uh, like the a postal truck, which is a government entity running, you know, hitting someone, hitting their car, and it can be just a fender bender case. Uh, it could be a med mal, a medical malpractice case uh, involving the Veterans Administration, which runs hospitals around the country, um, and lots of other de defensive cases. Um, and it can be also things about immigration and et cetera. But most of the office, so in our office, I'd say that's about a quarter of the AOSAs who are doing some type of civil work, but about three quarters of the office is doing criminal work. And that varies from bank robberies and, and mafia uh, murders uh, to um, securities fraud to healthcare fraud to um, drugs, um, immigration fraud, things like that. Um, so what you're doing, people who are doing, uh, you know, street drug cases or, or immigration cases, uh, those people and me, like we rarely interact. Um, uh, we see each other in the hall, but, uh, or we used to see each other in the hall, um, but we, our, our work almost never overlapped. On the other hand, uh, our work overlaps considerably with the people in, in our criminal healthcare fraud unit. And at least in Massachusetts, we do most of our cases together with them. And uh, we investigate the cases together and we decide what kind of, you know, do we have evidence of, of intent? And if so, how strong is it? If it's really strong, uh, we'll turn that into a criminal case. If it's, well, we think it's maybe not um, actual knowledge, but mere recklessness or deliberate ignorance. And if it's that kind of case, then we'll turn it into a civil case. And then you said in terms of um, opportunities after DOJ, um, like for someone in my position, the obvious places to go would be to go to a big law firm and defend pharmaceutical companies and other big healthcare providers, um, or to go work for a pharmaceutical company in-house or some other big healthcare provider in-house. Um, or to go do whistleblower work, um, which is what I'm going to go do, um, uh, which is basically bringing these key TAM cases uh, to the government and presenting them and saying, you know, here's what our client, uh, the fraud that our client saw at the company that they worked for or that the company that they were competing against. Um, and we think you should investigate this. And uh, the way that works is there's this uh, law called the False Claims Act, which says that um, the whistleblower, uh, or which is also known as the relator, is entitled to between 15 and typically 15 to 25 percent of what the government recovers in one of those cases. Um, anyways, those are in my world. That's kind of what you do. But if your if your background is doing drug cases um, and you leave, well, you can still go work for a big law firm. Sometimes they like the trial experience. Um, uh, where else do people go? I know people go to all sorts of different jobs, but um, I'd say big law firms are the most common place that people go after they leave the U.S. Attorney's Office. 
And what, what um, credentials are you looking for when you're hiring? Uh, do you hire uh, people right out of law school or do you prefer that they have some practical experience first? So we rarely hire straight out of law school, I'd say once every 10 years. It's, it's very, it, it, DOJ has a program called the trial, uh, the honors program where they do take uh, uh, law students right out of school. Um, that's a special program, but that's only in Washington. I don't think it's in any regional, any of the U.S. attorney's offices. So we're typically looking for someone who is, um, I'd say, four to eight or nine years out of school, um, who has, um, you know, worked in a law firm and taken depositions and written complaints and and uh, maybe even gone to trial or worked. Uh, if they're if they if they're looking for if the person is looking for a job in the drug unit or the major crimes unit doing bank robbery cases and things um, where those cases go to trial more often we may try to look for people uh, from the local district attorney's office where people get a lot of trial experience but don't make very much money um, or from a public defender's office even uh, or from the state attorney general's office um, so you know those are our main sources of, I think of of hires big law firms. Um, and then DA's offices, state attorney general's offices. Well, thank you, Greg. This has been terrific. It was really a fascinating presentation and we so appreciate your time and uh, virtual round of applause. Okay, well, thanks all very much. And again, don't hesitate to email me if you wanna copy the slides or if you have any other questions. I'll be around for another couple of weeks. Thank you. Code for, the code for this session is fraud and we'll be starting our next panel in 10 minutes at 1.20. Thank you, everyone.
Hi, can everyone hear me? Great. Okay, great. Well, welcome everybody. Uh, this is uh, truly uh, a little strange uh, presenting in this way. Um, uh, my name is Steve Sozio. I'm a partner in the healthcare practice at Jones Day. And I am uh, pleased to be with you here today with a truly stellar panel to talk about uh, telehealth, telemedicine, digital health, uh, it goes by many names. And uh, it, we're gonna take, take you through some of the key issues that we're facing from a regulatory perspective and clinical perspective uh, in, de in dealing with telehealth. Telehealth has truly mushroomed through the pandemic. It's, it's been truly a lifesaver. It's, it's allowed delivery of healthcare to so many more people. Uh, and you know the government's recognized a need and has loosened up on some things, but we have a long, long way to go. And we have a stellar panel that's going to talk about that today. I'm gonna to ask each of the panelists to introduce themselves. I'll start. I'm going to be your moderator. As I said, my name is Steve Sozio. I, um, like Greg Shapiro, who just spoke a little while ago, I was uh, an assistant US attorney for about 11 years in the Department of Justice. But for the last 22 years, I have been uh, on the defense side, largely defending healthcare providers, pharmaceutical companies, medical device companies, um, in the kinds of cases that Greg Shapiro uh, brings uh, and uh, that the KeyTam Bar brings and uh, in, in related criminal investigations. Let me turn it over to Dr. Brian Zach from University Hospitals to introduce himself. Thank you so much. Uh, hello, my name is Brian Zach. I am a pediatrician by training here at Rainbow Babies and Children's and University Hospitals. Uh, also, I am the medical director and have been for the last three and a half years of our telehealth services and our newly grown department in the last 12 months. Uh, we have focused on either obviously provider engagement, uh, patient engagement, and currently obviously building our infrastructure, building our ability to reach patients where they want to be seen and keeping up with the many changes that we've seen within the reimbursement and regulatory landscapes. Thank you very much for having me. Thanks, Dr. Zek. Professor Madison? Yes, yeah, so thank you for having me too. I'm a professor of law and health sciences at Northeastern University, um, where I teach health law with a focus on the regulation of healthcare delivery, um, as well as health policy and health economics. I'm also currently serving as a reporter on the Uniform Law Commissioner Commission's effort uh, to draft a, a model of uniform state law related to telehealth. Thanks, Professor Madison. Mr. McClone from the Ohio Hospital Association. Sean? Hi, <clears throat> excuse me. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, happy to be here. My name is Sean McClone. I'm general counsel with the Ohio Hospital Association. Um, spent a uh, prior portion of my legal career at a law firm here in Columbus, Ohio uh, called Bricker and Eckler where I did a lot of work uh, in the healthcare space, primarily for hospitals. Um, I've since been with the hospital association for about 11 years, uh, doing a lot in the sort of public policy space, um, working with our advocacy team to advocate the position of hospitals on a variety of uh, legislative and regulatory issues um, and in front of a number of different regulatory agencies that, that impact the hospital industry. So happy to be here. I, I, I am not a, an expert in telehealth, although I think by virtue of having been in the healthcare space for the last 12 months, there's been a crash course for lots of people to become a little more expert in telehealth than they were a year ago. So look you're going to be able to provide us some great insight on, on the Ohio scene and what we're doing with the regulations there. Last and certainly not least from the Cleveland Clinic Foundation's law department, my good friend, Stephanie Switzer. Hi, and thank you also for, for having me participate with this esteemed panel. I have become a telemedicine expert, one might say, um, as uh, Sean said, in the last year, more so than I ever dreamed. Um, I've also been a healthcare lawyer for 20 something years. I'm not gonna count. I'm a senior counsel, as Steve said, at the Cleveland Clinic. I'm responsible for the telemedicine work group and I'm also chair of the nonprofit healthcare and reimbursement group, which means I spend a lot of my time in tax exempt org issues, as well as other regulatory issues, but very excited to talk to you uh, today. Thank you, Stephanie. Let's start our discussion with, with Dr. Zach, because uh, Dr. Zach, you are really, you know, where the rubber hits the road, right? You are trying to implement, oversee uh, telehealth, digital health, telemedicine, and maybe even explain to us exactly what it is 
and how it's being implemented across this major health system that you're affiliated with. Thank you so much, Steve. I, I think that question is so hard to answer because what it is is changing almost on a daily basis. Um, and so let's talk a little bit foundationally uh, in terms of what we face at University Hospitals and where we are now, and as your, the rest of this panel and certainly your audience can attest to, uh, some of the challenges that we need to answer and face as we move forward. Um, one of, you know, when we break down in the pre-COVID environment, um, kind of the different elements that add up into a telehealth or a digital health program, it comes down, I, I feel, to three things. It's the technology, the engagement of the providers and the patients, and also the evolving reimbursement and regulatory landscapes. And we have to make them all work to provide a product that's safe and effective and obviously reach the patients where they need to be. It, technology hasn't changed that much. Yes, there's been some great updates in the last 12 months. And certainly a lot of our platforms that, and different vendors we work with have made upgrades, certainly with their server capacity to meet the demand. But really, um, it's the engagement and the evolution and the regulatory and re reimbursement stage that has really propelled this forward. Prior to COVID, we had interested uh, providers, but these a lot of these visits weren't paid for, uh, whether it be by CMS and Medicare, state Medicaid here in Ohio, or our commercial partners as well. And so we were very much in an exploratory phase, uh, forgive the phrase, but a toe in the water. Um, and, and we tried it in many different places. Some of the most common ones were um, in within the global reimbursement period for surgical procedures. We could, a lot of our surgeons were leveraging it to follow up on their patients because that visit wasn't paid for. So it was actually an improvement in care in access. We used it in a couple small exploratory phases with psychiatry to help with connecting with uh, uh, behavioral health issues. But in terms of a larger scale and certainly volume, it wasn't there. Uh, people were too afraid to invest just because they wouldn't be paid for the services. Um, to, to give you a quantitative number to support that, in 2019, UH, with all of our efforts, performed just over 10,000 virtual visits, the majority of which were emergency psychiatric consultations in our emergency departments. In April, we did 90,000. And over the course of uh, 2020 as a whole, it was well over 400,000 virtual visits. So a 400% increase from the year before. Um, at one point, over 75% of our providers were using telehealth, especially in the peak at the end of March, early April. Um, and certainly those numbers have come down as our, uh, thank goodness, some of the illness has come down and we've been able to safely bring our patients back into the hospital and to the ambulatory practices. But it is here to stay and our providers wanna know where this fits in long-term. So we really have looked at telehealth in three tiers and this is very common to how you'll hear it spoken of on the CMS and Medicaid levels. It telehealth, telemedicine, and depending on who you're talking to, digital health versus virtual health. Telehealth, according to Medicare, is really just the audiovisual connection real time with a patient. Whereas when you get into telemedicine, you have a little bit more of a broader approach. It can be synchronous, like a live visit, audiovisual. They've actually, most payers are allowing for an audio only visit, which is really critical when we're talking about some of our digital divide. A lot of our rural and urban poor do not have Wi-Fi access or the equipment to make that work. So we're finding different ways to reach them in this new technology. Also, there's a tremendous explosion of asynchronous care, which is uh, stored forward, if you will. Um, and then finally, when you talk about the broadest definition, which is virtual health or digital health, you're talking about wrapping all points of contact with a patient digitally into the total healthcare picture. And I'm sure all of our colleagues here on the panel might explain it a little bit different, but that's sort of my summary of how I look at it. Where we are now is really about infrastructure and moving forward. We can all agree, I believe, that this form of care is here to stay. The different level of complexity and competition uh, from various elements of the healthcare system, be it uh, inpatient and, and uh, system-based, ambulatory practice-based, and even retail clinic and outside vendors um, who are providing virtual care as their main source of, of business. We are all trying to fit into this sandbox together now. And for all of our, our, uh, our independent systems, our, our employers to work, we have to make sure we provide a good product with good providers and give them the technology they need to move forward. So in terms of what challenges we're facing, um, a couple came to mind I wanted to share, and I'm sure the other members of the panel will be able to expand on this further. Um, we are now getting a lot of requests to practice across state lines. 
which covers a lot of issues, um, whether it be the state licensing issues, malpractice coverage, because different states have different liability laws, um, and also um, simple access for those patients. Is it an existing patient who's traveling or is a patient who hears you're the best of, of what you do and they wanna reach out regardless of where they're located? In addition, we have new use cases that have to do with patient and provider locations. Pre-COVID, um, believe it or not, there were a lot of regulations that required a patient be in an ambulatory setting or in a hospital setting to, to get reimbursed for, for telehealth. Of course, that's changed. And we have our direct-to-consumer or patient-at-home programs now. So, so much of this has changed and continues to evolve. I think our number one challenge will be keeping up with the regulatory and reimbursement guidelines set by the state and CMS, and then watching the trickle-down effect from our commercial payers. We want to empower our providers to provide a consistent product, but it's hard to do so when they're getting instructions from so many different uh, sources outside. Uh, it's really an exciting time. And we're looking forward to making this uh, not just a part of a part of our business model, our strategic plan, but a way, another tool that we can help provide the spectrum and the continuum of care for our patients. Thank you so much, Steve. Thanks, Dr. Zach. You know, I mean, the explosion that you've seen there at university hospitals, I think those numbers just tell, tell the story. And as you say, it's going to go down a bit, but people like it. And I think you're absolutely right. It's here to stay. Um, from my perspective on the, the um, corporate legal side of observing this, we are seeing a ton of private equity money going into telehealth provider groups, technology groups that are sponsoring it, and all sorts of sort of innovative ways to use it. So if, if you believe that there's some smart people running a lot of big private equity funds, uh, we'll, they're not going to put their money into places where they're not going to get a return. So I, I, I think you're absolutely right. And you also hit on another, I think, really key point, and that is, you know, the practice of medicine has largely been regulated at the state level. And so we, we, we have this, and, and telehealth was lagged, lagging way behind um, in terms of sort of adopting and adapting to what was needed. And so we have 50 different states handling it differently, plus the federal government. And uh, Professor Madison is deeply involved in, 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 a, in a process to try and bring some sanity <laughs> to this, uh, th this process of um, uh, the, you know, uniformity to the way, the way the states are looking at it. Professor Madison, if you could share with us a little bit of the efforts uh, that are underway to try and help people like Dr. Zach dealing with these cross-state uh, issues. Sure, it's, it's a real challenge. And as you point out, um, and, and Dr. Zach pointed out, this is not just a state to state issue, but also a state and federal issue and a Medicaid reimbursement issue. Um, and that's lots, that's lots of issues. Um, so I got in, involved in this actually a couple of years ago when I got an email um, inquiring whether I'd be interested in working with the Uniform Law Commission um, on issues related to telehealth. And I was immediately intrigued. I was a recovering um, contract law professor. So I'd heard of the Uniform Commercial Code and the ULC's former work. And then of course, as a health law professor, I was aware of the you know, growing importance and interest in, in telehealth um, and a few of the regulatory issues involving telehealth. Um, and so I thought it'd be interesting and I just didn't realize how interesting. Um, because it started off as a study committee on telehealth that looks at, you know, whether it might be feasible or desirable to uh, create a uniform law. That's where we started, and then the pandemic hit. And in 2020, the Uniform Law Commission decided um, that it would be desirable um, to draft a uniform law on, on telehealth. Um, and so I'm supporting that effort as a reporter. I don't represent the committee or the commission, but I'm working to help the commissioners who are appointed um, by um, states um, to put together what would be a uniform law. The other participants in this effort besides the appointed commissioners um, are um, people who have expertise that is really critical in, in crafting a high quality statute. And so, we have as observers um, and participants, healthcare providers, insurers, telemedicine providers, patient organizations, um, you know, all of these entities have a tremendous stake in, in what a regulation looks like. And they're really important to make sure that anything that gets drafted really does address policy concerns, but also anticipates the concerns that occur and arise at the state level 
among state legislatures and among uh, participants in the state um, lawmaking processes. Um, and so, you know, before the, the pandemic hit, we talked a lot about um, sort of hypotheses on, on what might be better and counterfactuals. Well, it doesn't work this way now and what might happen. Um, and then what happened with the pandemic is then we all of a sudden faced the reality. And one of the realities was state after state waived requirement after requirement and had to take all sorts of actions to deliver telehealth services and to support the delivery of telehealth services, including the delivery of telehealth services across state lines. And because, and then it became very clear some of the barriers um, that prevented telehealth services from reaching people um, in, the, in the states. Um, and so it raises real questions about what the scope of this committee's work um, ought to be. I think where we're starting right now is, first of all, um, trying to achieve clarity and consistency around how we talk about um, telehealth. So going back to some of what Brian Zach was talking about, sort of the idea that it encompasses both asynchronous and synchronous technologies, for example, um, and um, a variety of different ways of, of delivering healthcare um, services. From a, from a drafting point of view, what this, why this matters is it matters for provisions that relate to um, healthcare delivery and any special obligations around the delivery of telehealth services from a standard of practice perspective. Um, and separately for other potential parts of a, of a um, uniform law, it might matter if there are any rules that are related to payment policies. Um, and those two things are different, sort of standards of care and the payment reimbursement policies, they might entail different definitions, but it's something that um, we are thinking about. With respect to standard of care, it's clear that um, it's possible to establish a practitioner-patient relationship um, through um, telehealth, um, but there are questions about what, under what conditions those can be established. Um, and one of the things that um, the committee has talked about is whether there needs to be more clarity around um, the idea that there is no distinct standard of care um, for telehealth, that there's a generally applicable, applicable standard of care but then also whether there are any spe special limitations or rules or requirements related to the delivery of telehealth services. And so if you look across state laws, there's actually tremendous variation from state to state in the extent to which they speak to telehealth and what kind of um, rules they impose. And with respect to the standard of care and sort of expectations around the delivery of care, uh, for example, there may be different rules with respect to obtaining informed consent, different rules with respect to the documentation of what happens um, or the fact of a, of a telehealth encounter. Um, many states have rules relating to the delivery of particular services via telehealth. Um, one big area is uh, prescription of controlled substances, opioids. Um, in different states, handle that differently. They talk about it differently. They um, think about different drugs differently. They have different kinds of, of limitations. And so you know, in the effort to draft a model, model or uniform state law, one question is how do we try to bring that all together? One of the reasons why um, this is, is so important um, is that there are a number of organizations would like to be able to deliver health healthcare services across state lines and also individual practitioners who'd like to be able to deliver care across state lines and patients would like to receive care across state lines. So the current expectation is that practitioners are licensed in the state where the patient is located. And of course, for many um, physicians, this is not an issue at all because what they're doing is they're incorporating telehealth into what were formerly fully in-person practices. And so there's no state line issue. But for other issues, it, it will be, and this is part of what's, uh, for other providers it will be, and this is part of what's reflected in the pandemic waivers. Um, and so as um, Dr. Zach talked about, the, there are patients who are um, traveling or who move um, to different locations. And so in the aftermath of the pandemic, this was college students um, returning home, people going to second homes or moving in with parents. Um, or, or children, right? So there's a lot of movement. And so then the question is, well, can their physicians um, deliver follow-up services via telehealth? There's this, the centers of excellence idea that I think Dr. Zach also mentioned, 
the idea that maybe there might be in initial treatment in person um, and you know, can follow-up treatment be provided or can telehealth in general be provided across state lines. Um, and then there's just the, the idea of national delivery or multi-state delivery of telehealth services. You think about something like mental health um, services. Um, you know, can we have an organization or a practitioner in one state who then establishes a relationship across state lines and deliver um, those, those treatments? And so in those situations, there's lots of questions about how that works given the in-state regulation of the delivery of care. So for example, you could ask a physician to get a license in, in any state in which there is a patient to, which, to whom they want to deliver services, but that's time consuming, it's costly, there are um, obligations associated with that, like continuing medical education obligations, which differ um, in, in every state. There are interstate compacts that can help facilitate this issue for many different types of practitioners, but they don't always solve the problem. One um, approach that some states have taken is registration. So not quite licensure, but similar in some respects. And you know, if we want to move in that direction or more states want to move in that direction, what should that um, involve? And so all that's already, you know, there's a, there are a lot of things on that list and that's just focusing on um, the delivery of care. There's a whole separate set of questions with respect to payment um, practices um, from you know, issues from patient co-pays to reimbursement for providers and the ways that those rules um, differ from state to state. Um, and so there's a lot of issues that, that remain to be resolved and we are really sort of at the beginning of this, this process. Professor Madison, let me, let, let me ask you, is this effort being embraced at the state level or are you seeing resistance? And to ask the $64,000 question, do you think you're going to get there? You know, do you think eventually the commission will have success in getting some I, sort of I, recommended approach? I certainly hope so. I mean, it's certainly the case that there are many bills pending right now in legislatures across the country that do some of the things that, that we're looking at, that states are looking at changes in many, many different states. Um, the changes are all a little bit different. Right. And you know, the scope of the changes are different. The starting places of the states are, are different. Um, and so um, we are going sort of full steam ahead and we are being as cognizant as we can be of um, some of the, the conversations that are happening in the states so we can anticipate where they what direction they're headed and um, will have something that when the states are prepared to adopt um, can help guide them. But um, things are moving very fast, and so um, it will be interesting to see what happens. It's encouraging. The, uh, the, the medical associations are not quite as Neanderthal-like as the bar associations are, but <laughs> they do have a history of being a bit conservative and slow moving to change. So that, Let's that's say great I've, to hear. I've heard those parallels uh, <laughs> discussed many times. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm not going to throw stones, uh, <laughs> given, given the, the slowness with which our, our profession moves. Um, hey, let, let's now transition over to our state here, Ohio, and, and talk to Sean McClone from the Ohio Hospital Association. Tell us what's going on in Ohio, Sean, to kind of address the issues that both Dr. Zach and Professor Madison have raised. Yeah, thanks, Steve. Um, I think some of this will will ring very uh, familiar to Dr. Madison. I think most of most of what she said and, and, the, and what she's observing in terms of what states are struggling with, uh, Ohio is, is certainly among those, um, although I think has made some good progress that I'll talk about. But one of the points that uh, Dr. Zach made was that, you know, there was a, there was a time where providers were, were, quote, dipping their toes into this space and, you know, doing little things on the edges. And, and I would characterize the state's early approach to this issue as also dipping their, their toes in the water. And so while we had providers dipping their toes in the water because they weren't sure what was going to be reimbursed um, and how they could you know, financially support these, times, these kinds of programs and the technologies that go with them, we had the state really using the exact same words of dip, dipping their toes in because uh, frankly, they didn't know what they were buying. You know, there was just, there wasn't a whole lot of data to support uh, cost savings to the state, for example, and, and things of that nature. And so you had sort of a little bit of chicken and egg going on. What's gonna happen first? Is the state going to reimburse for these services or are providers gonna dive in and sort of force the issue? And so that's been a little bit of, of the dynamic, uh, certainly in Ohio. 
Um, so the state was initially very cautious. Um, you know, I, I think these discussions started in earnest in Ohio, I would say maybe eight years ago with policymakers, really driven by the Department of Medicaid. Um, the, the medical board uh, was starting to, um, you know, engage in these conversations. And I, I referenced the medical board because it wasn't that long ago that, that telemedicine was, you know, for physicians only. Um, and, and that has certainly changed in the last several months and in, in some cases in the last handful of years as, as APNs and others have, have been, you know, wading into this space. But um, I, I mentioned the medical board as an early conversation because at the time, really, it was about, you know, what can physicians do via telemed telemedicine? Um, but I, I would say the biggest, you know, impediment early on was this, the, the, the uncertainty around reimbursement. Um, so I'm, I'm going to do a little bit of an evolution of, of kind of where our state process began and kind of where we are today and, and how the pandemic um, catalyzed that, that process. Um, but I'm going back to about 2015 was really the first meaningful uh, state level regulation um, geared toward doing some level of reimbursement for telehealth services. Um, at the time, it required uh, synchronous, you know, both audio and visual connections. Um, it, re it required, and I think Dr. Zach alluded to this, there was a time when both the physician and the patient had to be really in a clinical setting. So there were no physicians working out of their basement and, and speaking to patients in their own basement um, like there are today. But it was started very you know, um, uh, limited in terms of the sites for both the patient and the provider. Um, I mentioned that, that early on providers you know, were limited to kind of physicians. There were some uh, psychologists, um, FQHC type entities that were you know, permitted to be reimbursed for some of these services. Um, but the scope of services was pretty limited. It was a lot of, um, you know, evaluation and management type services, um, not, not, not what you see today. And, and at the time, there was, an, there was a geographic limit in Ohio. The first, the first limit was a five-mile uh, requirement that the patient and the provider could not be any closer than five miles from each other um, for this type of service to be reimbursable. So you had, you know, and, and I know there are some some similar geographic limitations um, at the federal level under the Medicare program, but you know, at, at the at the outset, I think I would characterize that approach as certainly in hindsight very limited. Um, but even at the, even at the time, you know, we believed it was it was too limited, um, and we we then convened a a group of uh, telehealth experts from within our membership. In fact, we had folks from the Cleveland Clinic and University Hospitals on that group. And really was an effort to um, to identify policy opportunities for the hospital industry to, to advocate in this space, but also importantly, I think, was an effort to um, to start collecting some data about the success of these programs, the success of the you know um, the, the smaller programs that Dr. Zach alluded to, and, and why they were worth investing in um, to help grow you know the delivery of telehealth, and so. We, we had some specific um, metrics that we were trying to gather from our members who were, who, were, who were dipping their toes in this space, you know, cost savings, cost avoidance, how many transfers out of the community could you avoid, you know, so people could get care closer to their homes, um, you know, how many uh, readmissions might we avoid by having people, you know, access care in this way. And so we, we, we came up with some, some good metrics to really kind of start to tell the story better to policymakers. Um, and, and even, I will say this, even with a targeted effort to gather data, it was difficult. Um, I mean, it, it's hard to quantify sometimes cost avoidance, right? Costs that you did not incur. Uh, that's a tough metric to kind of wrap your head around. Or, or how many times did a patient not have to get shipped from, you know, their home in rural Ohio to, you know, a, an academic medical center in Cleveland? So those are some things that are, that are tough and made, made the sledding, you know, difficult. But... I think it did help to prove that there were, you know, access to care benefits and other and, and some cost saving benefits as well. Um, fast forward to, to 2017, our medical board did pass some rules. Um, Dr. Madison alluded to, you know, this, this, uh, the different approaches that states take with respect to pre prescribing controlled substances versus non-controlled substances. And even within those families of, of drugs, how they treat, um, 
you know, certain drugs within those cate categories. And, you know, our medical board was, was going into this process and some context was important in that we were pushing them to, you know, open the doors to controlled substance prescribing via telemedicine, while at the same time, the state was battling a raging opioid ep epidemic. And so there was lots of consternation in the, regula in the regulator space about, you know, going down this road. And so we, we got them there, um, but our, our regulation is, is admittedly a bit clunky. Um, you know, it's still got some kinks to, to have worked out, but it is, you know, it is a step in the right direction. It, it does help to, you know, um, give, give patients who are maybe on maintenance drugs, uh, the ability to get a refill, um, from, a, from their non, uh, from, 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 a, from a partner of their physician, for example, or, or somebody like that, if their physician is not available. And so there are some, um, some, you know, some meaningful progress made there, uh, with the medical board. Um, after that in, in 19, uh, was the first time our medical, I'm sorry, our Medicaid agency, really re-examined its own rule and, you know, took sort of what I would say would be the next iteration of the, of the, um, of the evolution to, uh, you know, expand locations for the patient site. It allowed patients to be at home. It allowed them to be at school. So you had, you know, lots of pe pediatric care could be delivered to kids at their school. Um, much fewer restriction on practitioner sites. So it didn't always have to be a clinical site for the practitioner either. It still did, however, require uh, synchronous communication. And so that was continuing to be something that, that our state regulators required. Um, but again, incrementally, it was, it, was, uh, it was progress. It was good progress. Um, so pre-pandemic, we, we did make some good progress. Uh, Post-pandemic, you know, it, it, is, it has been a catalyst unlike any other I think we've seen in, the, in, in healthcare. Uh, in terms of the adoption of, of different technologies, but also the, the, the warp speed with which government is moving. Um, if, if any of you have, have worked with governments on regulations or, or statutes in the past, you know, those are multi-year slogs in most cases. Uh, in this case, you know, our, our state Medicaid agency uh, published an emergency telehealth rule within 10 days of the, of the declared uh, uh, declaration by our governor of a, of a state of emergency. And that's, I mean, that is unheard of. I, I can't even quantify how unheard of that is, but it, but it, but it really is. And it, and it broke down significant barriers, um, you know, made the patient site and the practitioner site, you know, anywhere on earth. Um, so that you did have, you know, patients in their basement and docs in their basement uh, communicating and, and having care delivered in that, in that way. Um, it opened the door to asynchronous communication. Um, it opened the door for greater uh, different types of providers to be allowed to, to, to pro pro provide care under uh, via telemedicine, including, you know, dietitians and audiologists and, and speech and language uh, pathologists and, you know, uh, physical therapists and occupational therapists. And it really, you know, I don't know if I'm overstating it by saying virtually any healthcare provider in Ohio that holds a license, uh, that's pretty close to true. I, I, I wouldn't hold me, my, myself to that exactly, but it's pretty close. Um, you know, other, uh, you know, expansions of technologies to, to allow just phone calls, um, you know, those kinds of things. Also some flexibility around medical record keeping and, and a recognition that uh, certainly in the pandemic, there might be situations where access to the medical record isn't readily available. Um, and so there's some recognition in our, in our uh, emergency rule uh, here in Ohio that, that says, you know, the practitioner should have access to the medical record to the greatest extent possible. And so it, it left open some, you know, some looseness that I, I think in prior pre-pandemic would, would really not have been, been permitted. So um, also lots of flexibility in the, in the behavioral health space as well. Um, but we have things like, you know, lactation consulting being, being delivered via telemedicine now, smoking and tobacco cessation counseling, and, and all kinds of services that uh, certainly I didn't envision, you know, occupying this space, but, but that certainly are. Um, so that, that emergency rule was, mar was effective in March. Uh, rules of that nature in Ohio, emergency rules in Ohio are, are, are good for, for 120 days and can be renewed one time uh, in an emergency way. And, and that was the case in, in this, in, here in Ohio. We did, we did renew that law, or I'm sorry, that regulation 
um, in July. I uh, did a little bit further expansion at the time, you know, included things like respiratory care, uh, respiratory therapists and athletic trainers and, and hospice aides and other providers that weren't wrapped up in the prior versions. Um, and, uh, and then that, those emergency rules were then uh, put into final rule format at the end, uh, in the middle of November. Largely the same uh, uh, substance as the emergency rules, um, again, allowing for synchronous and asynchronous. Specifically, the regulation specifically permits, you know, calls out a few, a few modalities, telephone, remote patient monitoring, email, uh, communication via patient portals is becoming more, more common, uh, we're hearing, um, things of that nature. So, you know, the, the explosion that, that both Dr. Zach talked about, and I, and I know that uh, Stephanie Switzer will mention as well, you know, our, our regulators are trying to keep up. Um, we think there's some, some space, you know, to move. There's certainly space in the commercial payer world to, to expand. Our legislature has taken uh, a couple of steps. One, um, to require uh, payers, uh, there are two parities that are often talked about in this space, coverage parity and payment parity. Coverage parity means that the payer is required to cover a service via, delivered via telemedicine if it would cover that same service if the service was delivered in person. Payment parity requires the payment to be equal between the, those two modalities of service. Um, we do not have payment parity in Ohio. We do have coverage parity, although that is a new development that just went into effect January 1 of this year. Um, and so it's a little too early to tell kind of how that's gone, but, but it is. it was a, another, another incremental step in the right direction. We also have some other uh, telehealth legislation pending that would, uh, in a nutshell, apply much of the Medicaid rules to the commercial space. Um, again, that's an early discussion, but just an example of kind of the next incremental step that is under discussion here in Ohio. So I raced through our history. Um, I'd be happy to take questions at the end, but, but Steve, I'll turn it back over to you. Thanks, Sean. But th these rules that frankly are seem to be working pretty well, I mean, they really have really gone a long way to helping the providers deliver this care and, and get paid. Do we think that the legislature is going to adopt them or that the Department of Health is going to adopt them so that most of it becomes permanent? Yeah, so, so the, 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 the Department of Medicaid did do uh, a, a, a permanent rule at, at mid-November, and so we think, we think that's here to stay. Right. Um, though, though the pandemic was the catalyst for it and really helped to shape it, um, the, the department is, is, has really embraced it. I think they've you know, uh, recognized its right. value. And, and so I think the legislature, you know, is, is going to continue to, to play in this space. And we certainly welcome the, the conversation around how do we make this apply to the, to the commercial space in, in a more uniform way? Because one of, the, one of the challenges right now is, though the, 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 the commercial payer community at large, you know, has loosened their, their, their reimbursement policies around this issue, if you've seen one commercial reimbursement policy, you've seen one re commercial reimbursement policy. <laughs> it's right. still wide variation. Well said. So, so any any way to um, you know d develop a little bit more of a uniform approach, I think, would be immensely helpful to the provider community. Yeah, great. You know, we have two two questions. One of which I'm going to ask Stephanie to answer because I know it's part of her uh, discussion here today. Let me take this. I'll take the second one first. Someone said, as Mr. Shapiro highlighted his presentation, fraud in telehealth is a focus area for enforcement. Do you think the heightened fraud concerns about telehealth are well-founded? Uh, yes, they are absolutely well-founded. We're seeing uh, lots of uh, documentation of it, um, you know, and it's across state lines, but also international, as, as I think you heard um, Greg mentioned. And, and if so, how can laws be improved to protect patients while still making telehealth practical for providers? The, this is something that I think all, all of our panelists are, are touching on to some degree. And it's something that, 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 that is sort of an ongoing process, right? We, we, we sort of rushed in to address the emergency needs caused by the pandemic. And naturally, when we do that, when we, when we don't take the deliberate, slow decision-making that, for example, Professor Madison's group is, is working on or, 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 or the Ohio Hospital Association is working on in Ohio, you know, there, there's going to be problems, there's going to be things that we don't think about, and there's going to be people who are going to take advantage of it. And we do, we absolutely see that going on um, in, in the system. But as I think we see, 
the Office of Inspector General of HHS has telehealth fraud as a priority in their work plan this year. Um, we, we, we see, you know, the, the, the states and at the federal level, which Stephanie's going to be talking about, you know, doing things to try and plug the holes. And now as we, as I think we're all acknowledging, this is here to stay, finding ways to minimize that risk. Fact remains, um, you know, healthcare fraud is real. Uh, it doesn't just happen in this space. It happens across, across the board. And we're going to have to continue to be vigilant in, 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 in fighting it. Um, Stephanie, we have a question here uh, that, that is part of what you're, you're going to talk to us about. Stephanie's going to speak of some of the changes in the federal reimbursement program um, that, that, that affect um, telehealth. She's also going to talk a little bit about some of the ways the Cleveland Clinic has been employing, um, employing telehealth across its organization uh, beyond physicians to some of the things that, that, that I think Sean was talking about with some of our physician extenders. Let me read the question, Stephanie, and then turn it over to you. How does reimbursement play into the conversation of telehealth? Specifically, are we seeing providers choose to opt out of Medicare, Medicaid, and only accepting private pay here based on some of the administrative burdens and hoops for licensure and services across state lines? Stephanie, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Um, let me take that first, and then I'll jump in a little bit to uh, what happened on a federal level uh, this year. Uh, I think the answer to that question goes a little bit to what Dr. Zach mentioned in the beginning, which was the dipping, the dipping of the toe. Um, to me, everything has changed in the last year and I can't speak for, for all providers. I think one significant barrier to smaller providers in the community. So in other words, not the Cleveland Clinic or, or um, UHs of the world that employ a lot of providers in a lot of different specialties, but to small physician practices is the cost of implementing a telemedicine program. Prior to what CMS did this past year, you know, you couldn't have a telemedicine visit in your private practice um, with a Medicare patient who was at home um, sheltering in place via FaceTime. You needed to have an appropriate, um, what they referred to as an interactive telecommunication system that was HIPAA compliant. And that HIPAA was one of the things that um, while well, we all you know, do FaceTime visits regularly, maybe with family and friends, but we don't often think about that from a HIPAA compliance perspective. And that clearly was one of the things that had to be waived this year um, by OCORR in order for physicians to be able to do that. So from, from, from that perspective, cost of the kind of infrastructure to be able to do this is a burden. But, but as Dr. Zach said, you know, a year ago, um, well, first of all, state Medicaid um, did not pay. It was starting to expand um, in certain circumstances, like to school kids, um, being able to have visits via telemedicine. That's fabulous across both rural communities and underprivileged communities. Um, Medicare only paid if a patient was in a rural area or if they went to what's called an originating site. So I think somebody alluded to that as well. You had to be somewhere um, and your physician had to be presumably uh, in her office uh, uh, to be able to bill for that service. And it had to be through one of these kind of interactive um, modalities that were HIPAA compliant. Those barriers I would like to see um, gone. Um, I, I just want to say on behalf of the provider community, I am not a clinician, but I've been a healthcare lawyer for a long time. And I think our healthcare providers went through literal hell this year to try to take care of patients, especially last March. And I'll get emotional about it having, having reviewed some of this. So it made me a little sad, you know, to hear some of the telemedicine um, fraud that was happening this year, because certainly I've, I've had a, a different focus on how to empower our physicians and other clinicians, other caregivers to try to take care of patients. Certainly that needs to be taken care of. I think getting back to the question, um, the issue of reimbursement is important. We need Medicaid to pay for these types of services. Whether we're in the middle of a pandemic or not, um, patients, it's easier sometimes for a patient to be able to see a provider than drive to the office, take time off of work, get their child out of school, take them into the office. On the other hand, we know from a disparity perspective that having a, having a cell phone or having broadband connection is, is also an issue. Um, I think that with CMS taking the lead as they often do with what is a billable service, um, 
the insurers, we pretty much saw that last year. They all kind of fell in line. Everything that happened with CMS last year happened in the first two weeks of May. I'm sorry, March. But within two months, we were starting to hear what the insurers were going to pay for. And what Medicare does from a billing perspective, insurers tend to follow. And I cannot see them going back. Um, I don't speak for uh, the the private insurers, but I do think that that's a very positive sign for providers out there who want to get more involved in telemedicine to take care of their patients. But right now, to me, their biggest risk um, or biggest barrier, other than state licensure, which you mentioned, is in um, just the cost of getting a system that's HIPAA compliant in place. Um, and, and hopefully there'll be ways that uh, larger systems uh, can share just like access to EMR with smaller providers across the country and in rural areas to make this more available. Stephanie, um, we have a question. Um, sure. Uh, and, you know, be interested to know what the clinic's doing about this, as well as UH, Dr. Zach, if you could speak to it or others. But it's an interesting question. Are telemedicine visits being recorded and stored as part of the medical record? Dr. Zach, you want to? Sure. Um, so at this point, they're not. Um, so we are performing the majority of our visits at current state on uh, outside vendor platforms such as Zoom and Doxy.me and Doximity. We are in the process of uh, implementing an enterprise-wide solution. And then when we do go there, we will not be recording either. Um, we do have an outside vendor. That as a patient, I want to say, I like that answer. <laughs> I, don't want my, I don't want my visits recorded. On multiple levels, Steve, you're exactly right. And I think that one of the things we have to remember is that we also live in a world where there are data breaches and there's hacking involved. And that is whether it's a real risk, meaning you feel like your firewall is up to snuff and it makes a difference, there's a perceived risk. And your goal is to provide safe care and the perception of safe care. We don't record our live visits when, Steve, you come to the office and see me. Why would I record it otherwise? And so that's the approach we're taking right now. And until our... Uh, our legal counsel tells me otherwise, I don't see it changing. Stephanie, how about at the Cleveland Clinic? That's absolutely true here as well. And I would say just in, you know, in light of what Dr. Zach said, in, in what we call bricks and mortar, those of us who spent a part of our lives in telemedicine and bricks and mortar, not only do we not record, but we tend to discourage patients from recording um, unless, you know, there, there's good reason for that. They, you know, have to have difficulty or, um, need to play it back or whatever. It, 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 inter it really interferes with the relationship. And that's certainly not something that um, we see value doing right now. Um, thanks. Thanks, Stephanie. We are out of time. I just want to thank the panelists. It's been terrific. Uh, telemedicine is absolutely here to stay. Digital health is here to stay. Um, and I think uh, sometimes out of catastrophe comes something good. And it, I think there's some real good that's going to come from this. Our code, for those of you who want CLE like me, is telehealth. So when you get your email, you have to put in telehealth to get credit for this. And I'll, I'll turn it back over to our moderator, uh, Kim Bixenstein. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Terrific discussion. Very interesting. And we will be starting our next panel uh, in less than 10 minutes at... 220 on innovation and the pandemic. It should be really stimulating. So please stay with us. See you soon.
on in. Thank you so much. Hi, Krista, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, I can hear you great. How are you? I'm good, how are you? Good. We'll get started in a couple minutes. Um, if anybody wants to rename themselves to include their title, they're welcome to do so. I think um, right now the screens are showing um, just first names for a few folks. Um, you can do that touching the dot, dot, dot. We'll give folks a couple more minutes um, to get started, but while we're waiting, how's everyone's morning been going? Busy. Busy, good. Busy is good sometimes. Yep. Oh, Susan, could you um, take a look and see if there's a way to enable Professor Kumar's, um, Professor Contreras' video? Well, my, for better or for worse, my video is okay. <laughs> okay great. Krista, can you at least hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Um, let me see. Susan, are you able to try to um, see if you uh, can enable Professor Kumar's video? She's saying she's having it um, show as disabled right now. There you go. All right. <laughs> Not sure what happened. <laughs> All right. So while we're waiting for everybody to um, log on and get back from the break, um, just a few words on how this is going to work. Um, I will have the Q and A um, open so that I can read questions if audience members have them along the way. The plan is to have each of our panelists introduce themselves a little bit, go into some questions for each of them, go into some questions that all of them I think should be able to respond to and then open it up to audience questions. Um, we'll probably reserve about 15 minutes at the end for that. Uh, but feel free to ask questions in the interim if you have them and I'll be monitoring the Q&A function. If I don't get to them during that uh, section, I'll get to them at the end of the open Q&A. All right, I think we can go ahead and get started. So uh, I'm Professor Laser. I'm excited to have recently joined the faculty at Cleveland Marshall where I focus on intellectual property and innovation law. Today's panel is going to focus on innovation in the pandemic. Advances in pharmaceuticals and medical devices cannot always happen without the incentives to innovate provided by things like intellectual property pro protection and the trust and safety that we have in our medical products and drugs that are protected by agency regulations. And yet all of these intellectual property and regulations can create um, thickets or slow the development of novel technology in emergency situations some people might urge. Today, we're going to discuss the lessons that the pandemic can teach us about the right balance between safe and fast innovation and about regulation versus agility. So to start with, we have a wonderful group of panelists here today. Uh, if each person could introduce themselves briefly, I'll start with Dr. Salata. Thanks, Krista. Uh, so I'm a professor at Case Western Reserve University. I'm also uh, the department chair 
of the Department of Medicine. And I'm also uh, trained as an infectious disease person, was very, has been very involved in the whole COVID situation, which we're gonna focus on today. Great, and I'll also add um, that you also have significant experience from the HIV crisis as well, right? Yes. All right, um, would Professor Kumar introduce yourself? Hi, uh, I'm Professor Sapna Kumar from the University of Houston Law Center. I'm also co-director of our intellectual property program, and I focus on US and international law issues with regard to patents. Great. Um, Professor Contreras? Great, hi. <clears throat> um, I'm George Contreras. I'm a law professor at the University of Utah, and I also have an adjunct appointment uh, in the Department of Human Genetics in the School of Medicine. I teach and uh, research in intellectual property law um, and uh, have been involved in a, uh, a group called the Open COVID Pledge, uh, which we'll talk about later today. Thank you very much. All right, so I'll jump right in for some questions that I think are best answered by Dr. Salata, but others are welcome to jump in. Dr. Salata, you have experience as a clinician getting treatments for infectious disease through the FDA process. Can you tell us a little bit more about the FDA approval process for the vaccines um, during the current coronavirus pandemic and the relative pace of some of the studies that we've seen to get approval of these vaccines fairly quickly? In this unprecedented time, it's been extraordinary to see how rapidly we've been able to move uh, to the point of having therapeutics, that is treatments, and also most importantly, the vaccines. Uh, the federal government named this process Operation Warp Speed. I never liked that term because that suggests that we're moving too rapidly or cutting corners. And that was not the case at all. As an example, I was the principal investigator of the Pfizer vaccine trial at our institution, one of 120 around the world. And um, we started this process uh, probably in May. We enrolled our first patient in August and completed uh, the enrollment of about 180 individuals uh, by the end of October. We had daily, sometimes twice daily, calls with our colleagues at Pfizer and uh, this was one of the most scrutinized clinical trials I've ever done, and I've been doing this for 30 years. In that regard, everything was very carefully managed, and uh, uh, I think that was important for the success in the end. I call this moving at the speed of science, not warp speed, and I think in that regard, we followed our leads, and uh, this was important. When enough information was gathered, and the primary endpoint here to look at vaccine efficacy was not only the safety issues, uh, but also how well it was in uh, effectively preventing COVID infection. And it was compared to placebo, that is we gave just um, salt water as the alternative in a randomized controlled unblinded, uh, blinded study. And the, it was 95% effective when you looked at this. This is similar to what Moderna reported at 94 plus percent. It's uh, different from some of the other vaccines, including Johnson & Johnson, which we could come back to later. But I think we are very proud as an organization and in being involved in such studies. Uh, it, as well, we were the first site in the country to start studying the antiviral drug called remdesivir. And this is the only one that's fully FDA approved right now. And in that regard, um, it is being used globally as part of the standard of care here for COVID infection. Related to uh, the FDA and the N, uh, this was granted Pfizer, Moderna, and now Johnson & Johnson, what is called early uh, emergency use authorization, excuse me. And that really occurred after the materials were submitted. There were expert uh, panelists uh, that are independent of the FDA looking at this data. And then they made their decision. All three of them have re received this. This is not full FDA approval yet. Uh, I know Pfizer is 
uh, going to submit that additional material to the FDA soon for that purpose. But everything looks pretty good. And the last thing I'll say right now is that the whole country of Israel, which has been ahead of everybody else around the world in terms of vaccinating their population, uh, did a real world experience of the efficacy of the uh, Pfizer vaccine. That was the only one they used there. And the predominant circulating virus in Israel is the UK variant, which is more contagious and probably also uh, is associated with more severe disease and death. And their uh, real life experience was that it was 94% effective, similar to the uh, studies that we were involved with. So that gives us, I think, um, further reassurance about how this has moved along. That's great. I love the term, the moving at the speed of science. It's, you know, we often wonder how much are we taking away from uh, safety when we move with a certain speed, but it sounds like in this process um, that we didn't really have that kind of compromise um, no. to safety. And yes, there are uh, side effects that have occurred with all of these vaccines. That's been well uh, reviewed in the literature and by anybody that's receiving the, medic uh, the vaccine. But uh, for the most part, we've seen no patients die uh, in a cause and effect relationship to the vaccine. And these uh, side effects that, uh, that occur are uh, very much uh, temporary. And by 24 to 48 hours, they're gone. Some people have more severe reactions than others. That's part of the course especially in those individuals getting vaccinated after having COVID before. And there's a lot of debate right now as to whether or not we can only use, we should only be using one dose uh, because they have such a vigorous immune response as manifested in part by their side effect profile. So uh, that's where we're at right now, but we did not sacrifice anything in terms of safety. Now, lastly, we are uh, following people from the vaccine trials out to two years after their second dose. And this is to look for late occurring safety signals and also to look at the durability of the immune response. You may know that uh, Pfizer and Moderna now are starting booster doses and or next generation doses to address uh, right now the variants that are circulating around the world, including in the United States. That's very helpful. Um, one last question on this. You've worked on the HIV pandemic as well. Do you see any parallels between how we've responded to the coronavirus versus the HIV pandemic and why that process might be the same or different? Well, in some ways it's the same with respect to the fear that was among our healthcare workers initially in caring for HIV infected individuals and later with coronavirus. Uh, so that's similar. But these, again, the speed of the science here has been greatly accelerated by coronavirus. Within two weeks of its first being detected, we had the full genetic sequence or makeup of this virus available to us. That really led to the development, not only of therapeutic agents, that is drugs to treat it, but also the vaccine initiative. So very early in March of 2020, there were studies by uh, multiple scientific groups on the development of these vaccines and it led us to this point. In nine months to imagine having a vaccine is just extraordinary. In most other vaccine trials, it takes years. And also that was the case with HIV. By the time we identified this virus and developed diagnostic tests and treatments, it wasn't until the mid 90s when this was first discovered that is HIV in 1979, 1980, that we had very potent medications available for treatment. So that really is a much more condensed timeline in terms of the COVID situation. Thanks. And I guess one more follow up. Um, do you think that this virus has taught us lessons about how fast we can innovate in a pandemic that we can now bring to future diseases. Absolutely, it's mind boggling. But one example let me use is the development of the messenger RNA technology 
for delivery of both Moderna and Pfizer vaccines. Uh, this was actually in place for over a decade before we arrived at this as a strategy. But uh, the idea that we can use this for other vaccines, even new generation COVID vaccines and uh, whatnot is just astounding. This was first being developed, uh, by the way, in Germany uh, for the uh, potential application of drugs to use in cancer. So that's another area. So I think there's gonna be tremendous spillover into many other areas, uh, just in part related to that technology alone, but how rapidly we were able to mobilize and actually the cooperation, uh, which was extraordinary between not only folks in this country, but around the world to get this done. Thank you. I'm gonna move on to some questions for Professor Kumar. Um, before we do that, I'd like to note that for those seeking CLE credit, the code to use on your form is INNOVATE. Um, the code again is INNOVATE. All right, so Professor mm -hmm. Kumar, uh, intellectual property can also be another hurdle to expedient deployment of drugs and treatments in emergencies. And you wrote a paper recently on patenting in the pandemic. Can you tell us a little bit about that work? Sure. So patents are really a double-edged sword. On one hand, we need them to spur innovation. And that includes during epidemics, pandemics, or the like, we need um, drug manufacturers, we need pharmaceutical industry to have an incentive to produce new drugs to treat the pandemic. On the other hand, patents can lead to drug shortages. And so the question is, how do you mitigate those two things? How do you have sufficient incentives while being able to address situations when there aren't enough drugs. And we've seen it play out um, in two different ways. Uh, just to give a couple of examples, a good example is with Johnson & Johnson and Merck cooperating. We, you know, there wasn't enough production facilities for the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. And while the Biden administration kind of helped nudge the agreement along, Ultimately, the two companies cooperated with each other with Johnson & Johnson sharing its knowledge, its know-how and technology and Merck agreeing to produce the drug. So that's an example of a good voluntary outcome. But we've seen bad outcomes as well. Um, and I think remdesivir is the best example of this, where Gilead Sciences did outlicense to some um, manufacturers in India in Pakistan and elsewhere but they restricted it to only certain countries. So while we had a shortage in the US last summer of remdesivir, countries in Asia and elsewhere had plenty. Um, and that included in Bangladesh where they weren't subject to the patent for remdesivir, independently created it in a period of just months and then started exporting it to 19 other countries. So in my paper, what I talk about is we need to have more mechanisms to deal with those kinds of situations where you have a life-saving drug, but you have a company that's not fully taking advantage of uh, you know, producing it at the level that it's needed. Thanks. So what mechanisms do you think that uh, the US government could use or that other governments can use to make sure that we're having access to as many vaccines and drugs as we need during a pandemic? or another sure. emergency situation. Sure, so under existing law, we have mechanisms for the government to produce patented goods without patent holder permission or to enter into a contract with a third party to produce drugs or other patented goods um, on behalf of the US government. And we, you know, this is generally referred to as what's called compulsory licensing. And right now under US law, it's extremely difficult for a third party manufacturer to obtain a compulsory license, even if it has the production capacity to help out. Um, so one thing we need to do is make that process easier where if there's a shortage, a court should be able to just authorize the compulsory license. And a second issue is where the, where the government is funding the production of the drugs. In those cases, I think there should be a requirement that in the event of a drug shortage, 
that the patent holder, the pharmaceutical company should be required to out license the technology to another company, like what we saw voluntarily happen between Johnson and Johnson and Merck. Just to follow up on that, you mentioned compulsory licensing. You know, what are some of the reasons why policymakers perhaps wouldn't want to expand compulsory licensing or why, why is there pushback against compulsory licensing in some circumstances? Sure, there's always a, you know, part of this is about striking the right balance. You need to have enough incentives that when the next pandemic rolls around, there will be companies that are willing to invest the money and put in the time and effort to get new drugs. On the other hand, you want to have some kind of a balance, and that includes not just shortages, but also for cases involving countries that can't afford a drug, countries that don't have access to it. You need a mechanism for them to be able to get the drug as well. And as you can guess, there's a lot of money that rides on this. And so on one hand, you have a very influential pharmaceutical lobby that basically wants patents to be as strong as possible and doesn't want any carve outs in it. And on the other hand, you have groups like Doctors Without Borders, you have humanitarian groups that are trying to gain you know, greater access to drugs for people who don't have them. And so the question is, how do we best you know, walk that, you know, that line between spurring innovation and not, um, not, you know, not excluding access to certain groups? I, you know, it's an interesting point, something we discussed in my innovation law class a few weeks ago was how do we provide the incentives for pharmaceutical companies to try to support compulsory licensing and one of the, one of the concerns I think that many pharmaceutical companies have is over gray market goods, if they offer a lower pricing to uh, a third world country, is that going to result in those kind of drugs coming into the US at low uh, prices? and not being able to fully recoup the value of that. So, you know, perhaps um, having more protections against gray market goods could help to uh, support the policy goals of compulsory yeah. licensing. And to be clear with drugs, you can't really have gray market drugs because of how the FDA regulations work. You know, it's only gonna be the licensed, um, you know, the, the patent holder basically, who's gonna be able to authorize the drugs. You can't just import in another source of drugs. Um, at least that's, I'm not an FDA expert, but my understanding is you can't, um, you know, you can't bring in gray market drugs. Yeah, they won't be labeled properly for sale exactly. in the US. Exactly, that's exactly. So it doesn't, doesn't stop people from doing so illegally, I suppose. Fair enough. <laughs> Uh, great. Well, thanks. Thanks for that. Um, I'll move on to some questions for Professor Contreras. Uh, unless others have commentary on any of these questions of of uh, getting these getting these drugs um, compulsory licenses or otherwise getting access to patented drugs, any other comments on those from the other panelists? No. All right, um, Professor Contreras. So you mentioned earlier that you were involved in um, what's called the COVID nineteen pledge. Um, and, you know, there are ways that the patent system can sometimes be changed, uh, but businesses can also take a lead on their own to address various hurdles. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about what the COVID-19 pledge is and what it's been used for during the pandemic? Sure, <clears throat> sure, absolutely. Um, so in thinking about the technologies and the products that are necessary to respond to a pandemic like this, there, there's a wide range of products and technologies beyond the vaccines and therapies that we've been talking about. Um, if you recall, uh, a year ago in March 2020, when the pandemic first uh, appeared in a big way on the radar screen of most people in the United States, there was a spate of news stories about um, how patents were being used to disrupt or to limit the supply of things like hospital ventilators, um, respirators, other PPE equipment, diagnostic kits, and so forth. Um, the conversation, of course, uh, about uh, vaccines and therapies uh, was there and, and was quite prominent, but this other conversation was going on as well uh, because there's a whole range of, um, of technologies necessary uh, to respond to a pandemic of this scope. Um, and so as a result of that, uh, I and a number of other uh, academics, uh, legal and, and scientific and engineering 
types got together to try to figure out a way that we could facilitate firms and institutions that held intellectual property rights in these areas to make them available in the response to COVID-19. Um, you know, there are clearly mechanisms, as Professor Kumar mentioned, such as compulsory licensing, also efforts uh, through the United Nations uh, to pool intellectual property in these areas. And those, those efforts are, of course, very important and largely focused on the vaccine and therapeutic world, um, but not so much in these other areas uh, where, you know, just taken all together, they probably represent 90% of the intellectual property um, that is relevant to the, um, to, to the pandemic. And so we put together a framework, just sort of a, a set of legal documents that could be used by entities to contribute their IP without charge to the response to COVID-19 um, only during the duration of the pandemic and uh, for a year after that, um, and only for use within the, uh, the field of responding to the pandemic. Thank you. So I noticed that um, there were a number of different technology companies that signed onto the pledge, such as Intel. Uh, why do you think it is that more biopharmaceutical companies and therapeutics makers um, had not signed the pledge? Yeah, we, we observed some very interesting trends uh, when the pledge was rolled out last April. And, and it was exactly as you said, um, I mean, we did, well, we got a variety of entities that came forward and made pledges. The, the vast majority of the rights that were pledged were in areas like digital innovation, um, software, uh, but also in uh, medical devices and products, protective equipment, um, and so forth. Relatively little in the area of biopharmaceuticals. And, and I think they, they're just different markets, very different markets. Um, in the biopharmaceutical area, uh, the vaccine that's produced, the therapy that's produced is a, a major source of revenue for a particular company. And uh, opening intellectual property to competitors might be viewed as uh, counterproductive for an entity. Some, some of these entities like Moderna have pledged their intellectual property um, in this area, but, but there are you know, speculation about reasons that they did that, which is not entirely uh, altruistic. Um, nevertheless, the financial equation is very different. Um, for the technology sector, um, those companies don't rely on patents in this area as principal revenue sources. They primarily sell products and so, these types of companies that aren't going to uh, make a business of monetizing their patents or trying to block competitors um, were able to take this step uh, for a number of reasons. I mean, both out of a sense of corporate social responsibility, um, which generates goodwill both externally uh, with the public, with government regulators, but also internally with employees and internal stakeholders. So there's that plus. Um, but they also uh, open up technologies uh, for use in ways that might not have been contemplated. So for example, contact tracing is uh, an example of a technology that's become important uh, for modeling disease spread um, and uh, for attempting to um, constrain disease spread. Um, much of the intellectual property around the logic and the, uh, the tracing algorithms and disease modeling and predictive algorithms is held by large companies that made these pledges. IBM, Fujitsu, Intel, Microsoft, Facebook, Amazon, all of these companies pledged basically all of their patents um, in the fight against COVID-19, which creates in these areas like disease modeling, contact tracing, even to some degree um, disease uh, discovery, um, it creates a, 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 what, what we like to think of as an open innovation field where small entities, small companies, individuals can experiment, create apps and whatnot without the threat of patent litigation 
um, lurking in the background. And just to clarify for those who aren't very familiar with the pledge, uh, does the pledge provide only for non-commercial use or does it permit commercial use if it's for the purposes of uh, helping against the pandemic? Yeah, that was a really interesting uh, design choice that we had to make. Um, a number of pledges like this are limited to non-commercial use, but we decided that we would not create that restriction because the main point of this was to get products into the marketplace, into the supply chain, and you know, companies who make products have to sell them. Um, they can't just give them away in most cases. And so to respond to the pandemic, we thought that allowing commercial use was important. So we don't have any restrictions on the downstream uses of the pledged IP. It can be for commercial use. We don't restrict prices. Um, there are separate price gouging laws in, in effect in, in, in many countries um, that are in theory uh, in place to handle that. Um, but we did wanna give the users of this technology the maximum flexibility um, to use the pledge technology. Great, thanks. And what are some examples, you mentioned a couple of technologies along the way, but what are some of the technologies and treatments that you've seen benefit the most from the licenses granted under the COVID pledge? Yeah, so I, I, first I'll give you a caveat, which is it's, it's difficult to, to, to trace this uh, because we don't ask licensees or users to identify themselves or to register in some way. We, we could have done that in some other pledges, such as some pledges uh, offered by a university licensors do have those types of registration and record keeping requirements. And, and we thought that would just be a disincentive um, to signing up. So the caveat that it's difficult to track these things, if you lump together um, the open COVID pledge plus other pledges made by companies in the field um, unilaterally, um, the, a great example is hospital ventilators, um, right? These are very important uh, for uh, treating patients who present with symptoms of COVID-19. Um, and we all heard the horrific stories of incredible shortages in hospitals, both in the United States and also around the world of this equipment, people having to share ventilators and so forth. One of the problems was the inability to create parts um, for ventilators. They do wear out relatively rapidly um, and you need more parts and the supply could not keep up. Um, and so you start to have individuals creating parts using 3D printers in their garages. Um, these in theory infringe intellectual property rights. And there was some press about that early on in the pandemic. Large ventilator manufacturers like Medtronic and Smith's group um, pledged that they wouldn't assert IP rights against people who were making ventilator parts um, to go in their ventilators. As part of the open COVID pledge, there is an open source ventilator consortium called the uh, OVSI, the Open Ventilator Systems Initiative uh, out of the UK, um, which makes a ventilator, has made ventilator designs primarily uh, for portable ventilators for use in the developing world, free and publicly available with no intellectual property. And, and that's, that's a great story because this is a very important piece of equipment um, that, that is in dire need um, in, in responding to a pandemic like this. Uh, masks and respirators is another good example. Two national laboratories, Sandia and NASA JPL, um, are part of the Open COVID pledge, and they developed um, respirators uh, and, and masks that could be produced at home, uh, N95 respirators that could be produced using 3D printers and easily obtainable materials, um, and made all of this um, uh, information and intellectual property publicly available. So. You know, there are some, some good examples, definitely not as high profile as the vaccine space, uh, but, but we, we feel this is, you know, a gap um, in, in the, uh, you know, in, in the innovation and intellectual property world that's not really being addressed by governments with compulsory licensing or the World Health Organization, um, but is still important uh, in the COVID response. Makes sense. And it sounds like there may be a lot more that can be possible with this sort of industry or private negotiation um, than could be possible from, from as you said, com government compulsory licensing or forcing 
industry participants to engage um, in a certain way with the market. Um, what other lessons do you think that we can draw from the Open COVID pledge and its successes on the possibility for industry cooperation on intellectual property issues in future emergencies? Yeah, well, I mean, of course, so since uh, a number of us uh, were academics who, um, you know, who, who created this, you know, we, we were thinking sort of about the theoretical um, implications here and, and how this could be translated to other disasters, other public health crises, and the big one uh, that's looming ahead of all of us, which is climate change, global climate instability, um, and, and whether intellectual property sharing frameworks like this could be helpful in addressing those future situations. And, and I think the answer is yes. I think there is a willingness um, in the corporate and institutional world to make intellectual property available, um, especially if it's not being used in somebody's primary business um, without giving it away or contributing it to the public domain. Um, it's kind of a happy middle ground um, where they can do some good without seriously damaging you know, their own financial prospects. And, and I think that we, I, I will, I've already been in discussions with, with a number of companies about extending this type of framework to other areas. And uh, I, I think it looks very promising. Thank you. So I guess one last question on this before we move on to um, the general questions for everyone. You know, is there a fear at all that if there is a lot of public pressure um, to make intellectual property available in emergencies, um, does that undermine the incentive to innovate on, you know, breakthrough uh, medications or um, breakthrough medical innovations that could help in an emergency if that's the primary source of revenue that perhaps a company has? Yeah, so, so this is sort of, you know, a, a sub part under the compulsory licensing question, right? I mean, Compulsory licensing is often uh, opposed for that reason. Um, with a voluntary system, you know, I think I think the risk is much less. Um, you know, entities create intellectual property for many many reasons, and including just as side results of main development projects that they are putting together. Um, and so, I, I, I don't think that a voluntary system. Uh, impairs the innovation landscape at all. In fact, the voluntary system has many benefits in terms of innovation and creating an open innovation landscape. And there's sort of a broader story and theory around these types of patent pledges. If you remember uh, back in 2014, Tesla Motors, Elon Musk pledged that Tesla would not assert its patents against anyone who uh, was using them in the electrical vehicle space. Um, that seems counterproductive. It seems like, uh, you know, self-inflicted harm, uh, but it's really not, right? The goal for Tesla was to um, increase the broad infrastructure uh, throughout the country for electrical vehicles, um, something that one company alone couldn't do. And if you view your competitor, not as other electric vehicle makers, but as the traditional gasoline-powered automotive industry, then you want as many innovators as possible outside of your company to join in. And so I think with, again, examples like contact tracing and so forth, um, you know, Microsoft or Facebook might not have been the one to make the best contact tracing app that would be adopted all over the world. That's probably going to emerge from local, you know, players in different countries around the world, maybe even individuals or healthcare providers, um, but uh, they're, you know, Innovation helps um, the uh, the whole industry um, uh, when when we're continuing to use you know products that that uh, link with uh, with these outside innovations. Thank you. I see Professor Kumar has some thoughts on this as well. Go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to say, it, ideally, we want to get pharmaceutical companies, patent holders of life-saving technology and the like to act in a voluntary fashion to do the right thing. If there's any way to spur that we should be, or to foster that, we should be doing that. I just think we need both carrots and sticks. I think that, you know, we need to try to encourage them to do the right thing as much as we can. And if that doesn't work, if they won't, you know, not only will they, you know, not produce enough, but they won't share the know-how that they have with others, they won't share the technology with others, then I think we need to have backup plans um, 
for those situations. Fair point. All right, so um, if anybody in the audience has questions, please submit it through the Q&A. Uh, we don't have any questions in there yet, so I'll jump to some that I have for all of the panelists, um, but anyone who has questions, please type it into the Q&A. All right, so there's some interesting news about India and some other countries petitioning the WTO to suspend certain IP rights during the pandemic. Uh, do the panelists have any view on whether that's necessary and what the potential repercussions could be uh, if something like that were to come into play? Yeah, I'm happy to, to go first on this. Um, this is a super, yeah, this is super interesting. So countries like India are trying to make basically the argument that look, you know, we've got a pandemic, there's lives on the line, we should be able to override, you know, all the requirements that we're currently subject to under the TRIPS agreement with regard to patent rights for these particular technologies and kind of be freed from these restrictions. And I see a couple of issues with this. Um, one, we need to have drug companies be you know, incentivized for the next pandemic. So I have the fear that first of all, if we found a way to suddenly say, okay, we're putting aside all patent rights on all drugs. Um, if there was a mechanism to do that, then I would be really concerned the next time we have a pandemic, who's gonna invest the money to you know, bring us the vaccines that we need, to bring us the treatments that we need, given that that could happen. Second, there's a feasibility problem as well in terms of whether the WTO can actually pull, like whether they can actually do anything. Um, and I know George is going to want to jump in on this, um, but I'll just, I'll just briefly say this. The U.S. violates the TRIPS agreement all the time with very little repercussion because, you know, we can just pay fees. We can just sort of ignore them. So, I mean, we punish other countries for exercising um, compulsory licensing, even though what they're doing complies with TRIPS by giving, you know, basically subjecting them to trade sanctions. So I'm not really sure what the WTO can actually do in this situation. And I'll let George expand on that further. Yeah, no, I, 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 I agree. And I, I think uh, Dr. Kumar has, has, has basically said it. There, the, w, the, the WTO cannot uh, suspend IP rights. It, only national governments can affect IP rights in their own countries. Countries who want to do that are already authorized to do that under the Doha Declaration of the TRIPS Agreement, um, which has been in place for 20 years now, and they've done it in the past. Um, India has issued compulsory licenses, Thailand, South Africa, Brazil, many countries have already done this. Uh, I mean, the, the, the request of the WTO, even though the press has reported it in a much more grandiose way, is really that the WTO should not enforce sanctions um, against countries that, that have done this. But, you know, WTO or not, um, there are ways that countries can impose sanctions unilaterally, and the United States does that all the time, uh, with or without the WTO. And so I, 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 I think it's a nice gesture uh, that, that's sought, but I honestly, from a legal international law standpoint, don't think that it really is, is particularly effective in, in any real way. Thank you. Harkening back to the HIV uh, situation, uh, we, it, this always raises issues about creation of generic drugs at a much lower cost. And the only way to be able to treat people, uh, for instance, with HIV on a yearly basis, which in the United States may be as much as twenty to $25,000 per is to have available genetic, generic drugs. And I think there have been issues about oversight, quality, et cetera. So that all has to be taken into consideration, uh, not only in India, but other countries, some of which were mentioned. So I think it's always a balance here, you know, aside from the international laws that are being spoken about in terms of what's right for patients and what's right globally as well. Thank you. So we have a question from the audience that um, comes off of some of this as well. 
you know, many developing countries are facing diseases where there are insufficient financial incentives for major drug companies to develop the kind of breakthrough in science that we've seen in the COVID-19 pandemic and in other types of diseases that affect the wealthier, more developed world. Uh, what can we do to address the underfunding of neglected diseases and, and how can we help to change some of the economic incentives to ensure that uh, neglected diseases are the incentives for breakthrough medica medicine? Maybe I could start because I do work in Africa uh, in the HIV sphere, but they're facing uh, major if issues at present related to COVID on top of all those other problems like HIV, tuberculosis, malaria, et cetera. And I think, again, uh, some of this has typically sat with uh, the World Fund and other organizations like that. And also uh, there is funding through the Gates Foundation, uh, the World Health Organization and other things to try to balance exactly what you're asking about. But it's very difficult and challenging. And right now they can barely stay up with, uh, at least in Sub-Saharan Africa with, with enough testing, which we faced as well, right, in the US, but it's even more dramatic there and people are, are dying left and right from COVID. Uh, and um, so, but they have the other things to contend with as well. So we have to put this into perspective, develop priorities uh, as we move forward from a global health perspective, that's for sure. Do others have thoughts on other ways to increase incentives for these less uh, attended to diseases? Yeah, I wanted to just say that we, you know, for the countries that have the resources, we need to take a much longer term perspective with regard to funding for this kind of research. Um, I know that uh, Professor Anna Santos Rutschman's written about this, that just these temporary infusions of cash with regard to, oh, here's a pandemic, let's just pour some money into it. That's not a really effective way in terms of having long-term research get conducted. There needs to be a steady stream of funding. And part of that means that, you know, those of us in countries like the US need to realize that global, you know, public health is a global thing. If there's a pan, you know, if there's an epidemic going on somewhere that seems far away, well, that could impact us. So we need to, you know, take those outbreaks seriously before they reach our borders. And uh, an example of that, it's very important that you brought that up, is Ebola, for instance, when it occurs, occurred in Western Africa and large urban areas for the first time. And many of those cases did come to the U.S. as well. So we have to be on guard at all times. And the other message here for everybody to realize is that we're gonna see pandemics in the future. That was alluded to. Um, this continues to haunt us with air travel and the closeness of our populations. There's no doubt uh, that this will happen again. And I have to say that I've been um, so focused on this because we weren't prepared for this outbreak at all. And uh, if we do nothing, to, uh, uh, as suggest, suggested, uh, improve our infrastructure for dealing with this in the future, we're gonna continue to face uh, problems and challenges ahead. Yeah, it, it is, it's, but it's definitely a political decision, right? It's not a market decision. The pharmaceutical industry around the world is market-driven uh, by and large, and the market can't solve that particular problem. That's a political Problem. I mean, the fortunate thing is that uh, most basic research uh, is done in the academic sector, um, in, in this country anyway, and the US NIH has this $40 billion of extramural funding, um, is the biggest biomedical research funder in the world, and uh, academic researchers follow the money. Um, I mean, it's, it's obvious uh, what they're going to research. Um, there is so much research being done on cancer, even extremely rare cancers, because the NCI is, is an enormous source of funding. And that's a good thing. Uh, you know, we do want to eradicate cancer, but uh, there's very little funding in the United States for rare and tropical diseases. Um, and that could change. And I, I agree. Mm -hmm. 
Dr. Salata. It, it, this is, and, and, and Kumar said, it's a global problem. Like, thank God COVID-19 wasn't Ebola, um, you know, with double digit fatality rates. Um, it easily could have been. Um, we've dodged that bullet, uh, you know, just through sheer luck uh, in many cases. Um, but, but if the government uh, funded these types of research programs more, we can't rely entirely on philanthropic organizations like no. Bill and Melinda Gates, which, which have been very proactive, especially uh, with respect to malaria um, and other tropical diseases. But, you know, that's, that's not enough. Governments are the bigger source of funding. And just as another point, the NIH is very eager to fund international research. We have as much to learn from what's going on in other countries like the third world uh, developing areas of the world as we do here. So that's been a major theme pushed by the NIH among other funders. But since you mentioned, they're the major biomedical funding process in the United States. Uh, the same thing is happening in the UK and in European countries too. So I think we've woken up a bit to this issue that we're not isolated anymore. And we have to improve that process even more so. Is it where it should be? No, uh, but I think that's starting to happen. Yeah. Thank you for those answers. I think it's interesting when you try to say, what can the market do and what can governments do? Yep. Sometimes there may be mechanisms to try to change rules and, and laws and practices to further incentivize the market. For example, health impact fund is one way that this could be addressed where countries would put patents into a fund, uh, sell them at cost globally, mm -hmm. and then get a share uh, of the fund in exchange according to use. So that for example, if uh, an Ebola drug is developed in the US and distributed in Africa, the US would get funds for that. That could help to incentivize private market participation in those more um, it, uh, diseases in less developed countries. Um, one other question from the chat, I think that ties into this is, what are some of the factors that led the COVID-19 pandemic to be, to be one of those pandemics where we did see a rapid response, a uh, huge investment of resources and, and extremely fast deployment? I just wanted to mention the Defense Production Act because that's been one big help in terms of how do we cut red tape in terms of getting the vaccine, um, you know, the manufacturers, the, the tools that they need to produce enough of these drugs. And I don't think it was deployed nearly enough last year. I think we're seeing it get used a lot more now under the Biden administration. All right, well, we're running near the end. Um, we have one more question um, that I think might be a good way to wrap up. Um, you know, we, we need to take lessons away from the from this pandemic. Um, and one of them is, what do we do to prevent the next one and make sure that we have everything in place well beforehand and are not rushing at that time? Um, how do we get policymakers to focus on um, preventative investment in future pandemics? I think it starts at the top. And under the previous administration, this was not a priority in my view. And with the brand new CDC director, a friend of mine actually, uh, this has become a major issue for her. That is our um, uh, infrastructure in public health is very poor. And it's been further challenged by the fact that over 199 individuals uh, in the public health sector have either quit or been fired or have uh, just given this up. And I think that's a major lesson for us because undoubtedly, in my view, pandemics will occur again. The last one was in 2009 with the influenza pandemic, not nearly as severe as what we're seeing now, but could it be, as was mentioned, we see something like on the scale of Ebola occur, uh, this really will mandate that we change our whole perspective on this. So I think better prepared for one, having the right people in place, investing in that, in my view is very important because we can't be caught unprepared uh, un, uh, as we were this time. Thank you. Um, Professor Kumar, Professor Contreras, do you have any final thoughts on that? I'll just very quickly say, I mean, I think we in this country were lulled into a false sense of security uh, because previous epidemic scale outbreaks like SARS and H5N1 and uh, H1N1, 
we're not that serious in terms of human fatality or economic impact in this country, and so weren't viewed as a huge political priority. I mean, this, this really is driving the point home, and I think any sensible administration will, you know, ramp up the funding to CDC. What was done to CDC funding over the last uh, few years is atrocious and uh, really, you know, should be reversed and uh, completely uh, changed. And I, I think this is the lesson um, that we'll be able to point back to for a generation um, as to why we need pandemic preparedness in this country. I'll just add one last thought, which is this goes beyond innovation policy at the end of the day. We need, you know, people to have health insurance. We need paid sick leave so that people aren't showing up with symptoms of COVID-19 because otherwise they don't get paid that day. Like we need to address some of these broader, you know, infrastructure issues, you know, in addition to just thinking about IP policy. Well, thank you all for your input today. And I really enjoyed the conversation that we've had. So I appreciate you all coming. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you so much. All right, we'll see you later. And for those again who are seeking CLE, the code is innovate for this panel. Thank, thank you. you. Perfect discussion. Thanks, Kim. I want to thank all of our moderators and all of our speakers for their thoughtful insights and very helpful information. It was an excellent job. I want to thank the planning committee and the staff at the law school for all of their assistance today. I want to thank Susan Beach at the Bar Association for your excellent technical support and uh, Last but not least, I wanna thank our audience for your engagement. We truly hope that you found this uh, day to be informative and, and interesting. There will be a recording that will be available shortly on the website for Cleveland Marshall Law School. So please uh, invite others who could not attend today or whom you think might be interested to check out our recording. Uh, just to review the process again, for those of you seeking CLE credit, you need to write down the codes that were given intermittently today uh, on your evaluation form that will be emailed to you. And, um, and then uh, you should be getting uh, CLE credit automatically. Uh, for those of you who are um, admitted in Ohio, the, the law school will take care of forwarding your time that you spent um, if you submit those codes to the, the Supreme Court of Ohio directly. For those of you who are out of state, thank you for participating today. Uh, submit your codes to the law school and you will get a certificate of attendance and it will be up to you to submit those to your respective bar uh, associations or Supreme Courts. Thank you so much for your time today. Thank you, Professor Laser. great job. Thank you. Bye-bye everyone, have a great weekend. Bye.